can begin. Um, so I will call to order our PSC meeting for June 23rd, um, where we'll be discussing our commitment to racial justice and also the River Plan and South Reach with a hearing and recommendation. So thanks to everyone who's signed on to provide testimony for that and to the hundreds of others who have written testimony in the past few days and before that on this project. So thank you for participating. Um, I'm going to start off as we do these days to say that in keeping with the Oregon Public Meetings Law, statutory land use hearing requirements in Title 33 of the Portland City Code, the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission is holding this meeting virtually. All members of the PSC are attending remotely, and the city has made several avenues available for the public to watch the broadcast of this meeting. The PSC is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you for your patience, flexibility, sense of humor, and understanding as we manage through this difficult situation to do the city's business. And with that, I will ask if any commissioners have items of interest to share. I'm seeing Chris with his hands up, thanks. Chris, we're not hearing you yet. Do you have a- How about now? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I have been a member of uh, a work group on this commission around the Southwest Corridor. Uh, we originally had uh, four PSC members in that uh, particular group. Uh, ben and I are the only ones remaining. The other folks have, uh, have left the commission. Um, through my activity as liaison to the West Portland Town Center um, Community Advisory Committee, uh, it's become evident that probably we would get some benefit from reactivating that work group. And I've spoken to staff about that and they're enthusiastic. Um, so today I'm asking if there are volunteers who would like to get involved in that work uh, and we could then work with staff to uh, particularly get some advocacy around investment in uh, securing some of the, the naturally occurring affordable housing in the corridor and getting that uh, stabilized uh, as the the transit project comes online. So uh, hoping some of you will join Ben and I in that work. Mm -hmm. And is there an offer along with that to give someone a little briefing of what you've been up to and what would be involved? We could certainly do that. Yep. Are you gonna do that now or are you gonna sucker one of us <laughs> into being a volunteer and then tell us what we're in for? Well, let's say I'll take uh, tentative interest and then I'll tell you what you're getting into. Uh, I'm curious to know what you think you need and how, you know. Okay. Uh, time commitment and what's the what's the timeline for the whole project at this point, at least for our, for our advocacy role as you call it. Right. Well, I think you know, the advocacy role will probably stay all the way through construction, uh, but in the short term, uh, every council budget budget season is a potential advocacy for opportunity, particularly around funding uh, the early investment fund uh, for acquiring some of that uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. Okay. I saw Mike's hand up either as a volunteer or a new interest. Yeah, I'd be interested, pending, okay. pending how many meetings there are. <laughs> yeah, I guess that was my question too. What, what, do, you, right. what do you foresee, Chris? Well, you know, we, we used to have a monthly meeting schedule and that was clearly too much and, and those have lapsed. So uh, I'm thinking if, you know, if we are following the council budget calendar, it's about three times a year. Uh, maybe it's a little more frequent than that depending on what else is going on. So uh, think, think quarterly roughly. Okay. And how big a group? Well, we were four when we started. Uh, Andre and Andres used to be part of it uh, before they left the commission. No, no I meant, are we are, are we part of a larger advisory group, or are we simply? I mean, what what's the role? No, this this is a group basically to keep track of what's going on in the Southwest Quarter project overall, and recommend back to this commission when to perhaps uh, take on some advocacy with city council. So, you know, letters of recommendation around budget season, that sort of thing. Okay. Hey, Chris, uh, I think you already emailed me and I'm happy to support uh, in whatever ways you need. Delighted to hear that. Thank you. Okay. So I've got Jeff, uh, Oriana, and Mike. So maybe one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. We'll, uh, we'll get back to work. Thank you. Thank you much. All right. Um, any additional items of interest from commissioners? Okay. With that, I'll switch over to the director's report. Andrea, are you there? I am here. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you. You too. Uh, 
I'll start with just the updates on our uh, work plan priorities and where they are at uh, the council calendar. Just keep everyone updated on that. Uh, next week, July second, City Council will readopt uh, scheduled to readopt uh, Central City, and then they will resume work on the residential infill. They have on July 9th, a vote on the amendment package, and then the final vote scheduled for July twenty second. Um, and then the land use extension package that you all reviewed um, a couple of meetings ago, that is going to city council on the 8th of July. And, uh, and then I also wanted to let you know that we are doing work. Uh, we've been, I've been working with other bureau directors on the CARES Act distribution of dollars and how the city will prioritize allocation of the dollars that the city of Portland received. And that will um, is scheduled for an early um, July, I think July 8th. Um, uh, decision point by city council. And I will say that it, that uh, that process, I think, uh, and what's being considered and will be um, proposed by the mayor and city council did a really good job of applying the um, Office of Equity and Human Rights um, Equity Toolkit that they've developed. And um, we will be hearing from Dr. Markeisha Smith at the PSC um, at a future meeting. So you'll, you'll have a chance to learn more about that toolkit and the application of that. But uh, it really, the um, city council, we expect city council will really prioritize uh, distributing resources to um, black, indigenous, and people of color communities uh, first and foremost. And then uh, just to uh, celebrate that the city council passed the expanded opportunities for affordable housing package last week. So the work that you all did several months ago as well. And so that is, will make more um, affordable housing um, uh, opportunities for um, faith-based and other community organizations who want to take advantage of those changes. Um, and it also came with a new directive that I wanted to share with you all. So let me just read that here. Our new directive to BPS and our work, um, City Council has directed BPS to initiate a future mapping project that identifies with community members properties where a zoning change could create community benefits centering on anti-displacement strategies, equitable wealth generation, addressing past harms and furthering fair housing. So I wanted to make sure that Planning Sustainability Commission is aware of that directive um, and it's really re relevant to the conversation we're about to have um, about how what we can do more to commit to racial justice and delivering um, more equitable benefits through the land use and zoning work and the sustainability work that um, uh, BPS leads. And uh, I think with the release of the racial history, um, of, uh, the racist history of zoning and planning report that we did last fall, that kind of um, sets the, the groundwork and the foundation for um, kind of what's next. And um, as we're, I have a number of zoning packages that will be uh, coming to a conclusion um, later this year and early next year. It's really a very opportuni um, opportunistic time for us to think about uh, what, what new commitments that we wanna make and um, how do we kind of take and recognize the, the past harms that uh, the work of um, land use planning and zoning has had um, and the impact on communities, particularly our BIPOC communities and our black community in, in Portland and what are ways that we can really address um, those harms and address uh, reparations. So that is, I think, um, important work and we really are interested in the conversation that we'll be having this afternoon and hearing from the Planning and Sustainability Commission on what thoughts and ideas that you have. Um, I wanted to let you know that we've got time today on today's agenda, and then we will have time uh, in uh, July and also in August. We want to bring a report to you all on the um, our internal work on on equity and and centering equity in our work, and kind of report on our five year racial equity plan and where that stands and um, work that we see ahead for that. Um, we also want to, um, Dr. Markeisha Smith from the Office of Equity and Human Rights will join us for the July 28th meeting, and she'll walk through that equity um, toolkit, and in particular, really, um, how, that, how that toolkit is available to you all and is a, an important, um, uh, you know, there are important guides and questions in there that I think we can all um, 
use and apply to our work and really ask. And I really see the PSC as, as an important accountability place for BPS in our work. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the shortcomings in our work so far is really we haven't built, we haven't found ways yet to operationalize this commitment consistently and build in accountability mechanisms. And I, I really see the, um, your role as one of those points of help, helping us really begin to institutionalize this commitment and creating kind of clear expectations that as we bring work and proposals um, before you, that you are going to be asking us these questions. You're going to be holding us to account and making sure that we have done the advanced work, we've done the work with community and really developed um, proposals that are community-centered and community-led. community, community -led. So um, Dr. Smith will join us in July and then we will also have some um, uh, time still, we're still working on the calendar and availability, um, but we'll invite uh, the um, pleaders from PALF to come and walk through the people's um, action plan. And also um, our BIPOC staff will present on their ideas of what uh, the work that we have, um, opportunities we have to do this work and uh, uh, to prioritize next from the people's action plan that PALF developed. And we'll also share at that time uh, our anti-displacement update with you. And we're doing that work jointly with community um, anti-displacement PDX, but it's also um, uh, being led by PALF and they're one of our the fiscal sponsors for that. So they'll join for, for that conversation as well. Uh, and, and really looking for uh, to provide, use commission meetings to provide you with more information about where we're at um, and also provide you with more tools. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation that we'll have this afternoon about um, uh, other ways that you see that we can really um, deepen this commitment and uh, move forward and implement uh, this commitment that we've had. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Eli. Thanks. Thanks so much for the update. Yeah, it's a great lead in for our 45 minutes we're about to have. But before we get there, Jeff has a comment and then we still have some minutes to adopt. So Jeff first. Uh, question for Andrea. So at one point, we had sort of recommended this is going to the affordable housing uh, equal opportunity for affordable housing package several i think several parties presented asking for zone changes and we were sort of sympathetic but felt we really couldn't do it because they weren't a community-based organization is the directive from council to look at a wide range of potential properties or is there some some structure to what they want us to look at and the, these zoning packages or how, what do you think they want us to do? Um, it is, I think it's really looking at um, uh, the harms it, for our BIPOC community, especially our black community. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's gonna be, you know, I think the conversation that we're gonna have with, with you, with P Planning Sustainability Commission, the conversation that we'll have with community um, organizations and our own staff will help kind of um, identify options for that. I think there's a lot of, there are different different directions we can take, and I think the uh, what we are really seeking is kind of more clarity on those options, and also kind of a prioritization of what makes sense next. Um, the expanded opportunities for affordable housing also um, they asked us to look at some of the um, other properties that were not included in that final package for city council, and so we will be doing some follow up work there. So you. Um, We'll be bringing that to council uh, probably later this year. It is more than just looking at the specific properties that were not. Yeah, needed. yeah, yeah. It's really, it's really building, um, Jeff. It's really building on the report that we did last last fall on the racist history of zoning and planning. Okay. And um, I have not forgotten that you've asked for a report back on city city council items when they're approved and what's been changed, and so we'll build that into a future meeting as well. Okay. I was thinking about that. Perfect. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Then let's, would someone like to make a motion to consider the minutes and adopt them from June 9th? I so move. Thank you, Steph. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Steph's made a motion. Jeff seconded to approve the minutes from June 9th, 2020. Um, all in favor, practice raising your little hand. And I recognize Oriana's a co, so she can't do it. So we'll, I'll count them. Looks like we have unanimity. Thank you much, that passes. And we'll now shift to our first topic, the commitment to racial justice for our commission. And I am going to take Oriana up on the um, offer to facilitate. So I'll hand the baton 
And um, this is sort of our chance to talk amongst ourselves, knowing that we have some additional time booked in future meetings to dig into this deeper. So, Oriana, do you wanna start off? Yeah, I think I'll start with a question to Andrea uh, and to leadership on this call, which is to give us a little bit of an update on um, the racist history of planning, what's what's been happening for the past six months since we had that initial update, and uh, maybe give us a little bit of frame about what work is happening beyond just this expansion uh, to the project on the opportunities for affordable housing and give us a ground to start our conversation. Yeah, great question. Um, since we released the report, we've really been focusing on um, sharing that report out and doing um, uh, presentations and things with others within the city and also with other community organizations. We've had a lot of requests for that. Uh, we've partnered um, with our housing council to do some of those uh, presentations. A lot of that has paused for the moment um, after COVID. And uh, so we need to figure out kind of how to pick that up and, and resume. Um, in terms of the work, I think the, you know, the work plan now, um, I mean, we have made on the planning side, we've made um, some real um, kind of prioritizations of work around, you know, the anti-displacement work that uh, we'll be sharing more of an update with, with uh, the commission um, soon at a future meeting uh, is really now coming together. It took us some time to get the funding um, through the city process and to the partners, um, but they have now re um, uh, received the funding and are um, have hired uh, a coordinator. And that is gonna be helpful for us to, we are really the goal there in that work is to build a shared kind of um, joint table with community organizations to kind of a, you know, look at what are the um, kind of different tools that the city is using now and perhaps not using that we should be using um, to keep people in place, both looking at residents and businesses. Um, and to uh, look at uh, creating kind of a baseline in terms of, of where we're at now and making sure that we're tracking kind of progress and impacts. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, and then, um, uh, you know, really kind of looking at resources as well. How do we build, uh, as the city is developing infrastructure projects, for instance, how do we build in um, kind of a, a general practice that we are uh, putting in place dis, um, anti-displacement plans in at the beginning of these projects and building in ways to actually resource those, the programmatic needs um, that would come from uh, that kind of program. That would come from, you know, keeping people, whether it's, you know, stabilizing um, uh, homeowners or renters in a neighborhood or commercial businesses. So those are some of the elements of that work and our team will share more about that when they come to the commission. Uh, so, you know, that work has been prioritized. The, you know, West, um, West Town well, Portland Center work that you have recently heard about the last meeting is clearly a place where we're um, working to um, deliver equitable community development goals, working with community to address kind of broad um, goals of how to create spaces that are appropriate and responsive to local community needs um, and ensure that there's affordable housing, um, that we've got um, small business opportunities, particularly for BIPOC businesses to um, open up and stay in, in um, West Portland Town Center. So um, that's that's work that we've been doing. We've, we will be starting work around um, Park Rose and Brentwood Darlington around uh, land use zoning pro projects, looking at um, community center planning there. And that's really looking at cent uh, prioritizing equity as well. And that's new new work that we're, we're embarking on in this next fiscal year. Start um, So there are different places where we're really looking at how do we integrate integrate um, equity and equity goals into our work, and there's a lot more work to do. But those are just a few examples. There are others as well. 
I'll ask a second question and then spur discussion amongst other commissioners, which is, what are you doing to be accountable on the racial justice front right now? You've named equity a number of times, but I think it's important to name that we're framing this conversation as racial justice. And there's a distinction which we can talk about as commissioners a little bit, at least in my mind and in the mind of a lot of folks who do more justice focused work. But what accountability steps is the Bureau taking at this moment? Yeah, um, and that is, that is the place where we have um, had real shortcomings, to be completely fair and honest. Um, and that's really, I think, um, one, it's to make it, uh, making it clear that it's everybody's job to center racial justice and racial equity in our work. Uh, it is not just our community engagement staff. It's not just our equity um, staff's job. Um, it's not just our BIPOC staff's job. So I think that's one, and that's really been a change that we've made recently. Um, the companion piece to that, which is work that we're really uh, working on now moving forward, is how to build that into uh, evaluations, making sure that we're holding people accountable uh, and connecting that to their you know, assessments for merit increases, for instance, especially for managers. And I think a lot of it is really focusing on making sure that we're creating an environment where the ex expectation is managers are going to not only prioritize racial justice, but deliver um, and, and work with their staff to deliver and building that into our um, internal evaluation system. So those are some of the changes that we're looking at now. Uh, you know, the, the Bureau developed a five-year racial um, equity plan, um, some of which has been implemented, and we'll share more of that when we um, re will report that um, and we share those findings with you um, at a future meeting, and much you know, much of it has not. And so I think that is the uh, that is the place where we have you know enormous amount of work to do, and uh, I think a lot of I think strong commitment from leadership at this point to do it and to prioritize it and to make it um, make it real and really operate figure out ways to operationalize. Um, I think the other piece of it is around evaluation, doing a better job of evaluating our work, evaluating our impacts, tracking metrics. And that's a piece where uh, we need to build that in. We don't have that strong capacity right now. And I think that's something that um, there are opportunities there to collaborate with the Office of Equity and Human Rights. And, um, you know, but we need to prioritize figuring out how to resource that. So I would say the... Uh, we have, as a bureau, made some progress um, and have a lot of work to do. And there's um, a strong priority. Uh, you know, this is you know this is something that we, as leadership, and me as as the director, uh, am accountable for and need to need to be accountable for and deliver on. And so that's. Um, it's what I've expressed to our team is that this is this is a priority for me and I've appreciated the moment that we're at right now because it feels like it um, uh, there has it's unlocked kind of the potential for this conversation to happen in a more uh, functional way uh, than we've seen um, in the past and that's really because the bureau because we have not done enough to, uh, respond to the you know asks of our BIPAC staff and respond to the needs, creating kind of not only creating kind of safe, inclusive environments within BPS, but also to prioritize delivering racial equity benefits through our work. Um, there's just been a lot of frustration and hurt and pain and um, harm, uh, and so I think that has made it. So that situation and the fact that the, um, we haven't, um, as a bureau, moved fast enough and really implemented enough has um, on these actions has just, uh, you know, it, it, it's held us back. We've kind of, we hit this wall. And I think in the last um, few weeks, I feel like we're starting to break through that and um, just clearly identifying the steps and uh, changes that we need to put in place and um, and then being clear that it's on us to follow through.
Thanks, Andrea. So I think I'll turn it over to uh, commission discussion now, and I think there'll be lots of opportunities to bring in leadership for dialogue. Um, but I'll start with a little bit of a softball question, which is what did folks find challenging uh, about the, the different documents that we read or about this current moment, or we're an entirely white commission with quite a bit of power in this space? And so I think it's worth kind of starting with the conversation of uh, what is hard for us in this moment, because uh, I don't think that always gets surfaced enough. And I think we need to delve in really deeply to make this meaningful and effective. See Chris's hands up. You know, it, it's been interesting. I've been on this commission for 10 years. And uh, during that time, we have basically revamped all our planning doc documents, starting with the Portland plan, and then the comprehensive plan, and all the implementing uh, zoning to center equity. Um, and it was really a wake up call to kind of see the current moment uh, arrive and uh, sort of assess how little impact that's had so far. Um, so I, I'm coming around to understand that it's not a question of, uh, you know, just erasing uh, the the racist and inequitable language from old plans and, and making sure we have good policies, but there's a tremendous amount of work to dismantle the societal structures uh, that are perpetuating uh, a lot of this injustice. Um, so it's given me an appreciation of the amount of work. Um, yeah, I, I do want to comment a little bit on the all white commission. Um, that is certainly not intentional. Um, during uh, the time that I've been involved, we've worked very hard to make sure that there's diversity on the commission uh, and within the leadership group in the commission. Uh, and it's a, uh, an artifact of the moment that uh, you know several people um, have left for what I think are, are basically better roles that, that they can provide leadership in. So we're uh, we're kind of in a moment of restocking. But I don't think uh, I don't think that's an area where we've, we've particularly been deficient. Although at the moment uh, we have a look that's not so good. But um, I know the intent is there uh, to correct that in the near future. Thanks, Steph. Um, I think I do think Ben raised his hand before me, so I want to defer to Stack. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, it's okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, well, to to respond to um, to that um, specifically related to the all white commission, I do think that recognizing some of the structural barriers of um, that. Uh, that prevents participation, you know, the, the amount of time, the, uh, the amount of power and privilege of um, having, uh, being able to be in a multi-hour meeting um, that is unrecompensed um, and, and to be able to dive in to um, just the density of the amount of time and and the uh, access to to power, I think that those are a few um, issues to consider, and and I think that's across the the board on advisory bodies, but certainly this commission um, uh, exemplifies that. So uh, just being mindful of that, uh, and I think another piece, uh, uh, you know, I think of uh, most of the planning that that I have done or I have been involved in in the last decade, it's it's really been community-based. And so those plans, you know, the Jade District, um, the, you know, being, oh, witnessing the the Paul Faction Plan uh, or People's Plan come to fruition, that, that a number of community-based organizations basically it, developed their own plans. And so what is, what is our role when so many of the plans um, come from um, City Bureau? And you know that I think that there's that um, uh, that inequity to contend with that we have community-based plans um, and they don't easily intersect. Um, they don't always intersect with uh, bureau-based plans, and um, so I think having a conversation about like 
what do we prioritize? We had talked about um, in the officers meeting last week, I had brought up, um, you know, how do we do an assessment tool of stepping back before we make a decision? You know, what does a conversation around um, whether, you know, once we've been in the weeds a long time and we step back, have we actually furthered the outcomes that, that we have stated we wish to achieve? Um, what are the potential unintended consequences? And, you know, that we are an all white, like, how do we know? And how will we check against those assumptions? And, but also, uh, and I think um, Eli mentioned this uh, when we were chatting last week, you know, also how do we prioritize what, what comes before this commission? So, uh, and I'll, I'll stop. I, I feel like I'm wandering this because there's so much, <laughs> this is such a big, conversation, but I think another piece around the internal, you know, um, how do we support um, uh, BIPOC professionals in, uh, and, and leaders in, in urban planning? Last week, there was a 23-hour digital protest in Teach-In called the Unurbanist Assembly uh, that uh, um, Dr. Destiny, Destiny Thomas and a bunch of folks at Thrivens Group created around, like, you know, centering um, BIPOC leaders in looking at anti-racist urban planning. And I think what what is our role as a commission um, in, um, in ensuring that that happens um, and listening to that and, uh, and, and as a bureau supporting that uh, and similar, uh, similar teach-ins going forward because it was so powerful. And I'll, I have a lot, but other people I will stop there. Thank you. So I have Ben, uh, Eli, Mike, and then Katie on stack. And Chris, your hand is still raised, so feel free to keep it up if you want to uh, jump in as well. But go ahead, Ben. I'll try to be brief. Uh, to me, a huge light bulb went off when we um, looked at the history of racial planning uh, last fall. And, and, and that was to really see, and some of it was a surprise, some of it wasn't, but to really see how throughout the history of planning, and which is essentially, you know, what this commission or one of the main tasks of this commission has is so eradicated in, 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 in exclusionary practice. And the, the, this, what the, I, it was actually good that you sent it out that we had it all up chance to to brush up on it, but rather the forefront of it, as it was talking about the definition of planning itself, um, it really talked about what it does. It's really the practice of separating uses. So in and of itself, there is that kind of uh, segregation that it uh, creates. So my main challenge right now is really reconcile um, what at the core we're trying to do with with uh, with all that's going on and the conversation that we're having and making sure that it's not necessarily just a conversation that uh, maybe attacks some of the rules, but but I think has the potential to really become something that perhaps is more of a seismic change in how we regulate land use, how we regulate zoning. Maybe there are uh, different ways to to uh, to do that, there are more inclusive and there are less uh, um, boundary based. And I think if, if we reflect on, for instance, on some of the projects that we've uh, done in the last couple of years, like the uh, um, residential infill and the better housing by design, I think they start to move away from the two-dimensional Euclidean zoning and kind of really more kind of go towards regulating form and things like that. That is, is really an outcome base rather than a, uh, you know, a uh, kind of regulating boundaries. So I'll stop here, but I guess the point I'm making is how does that translate into, you know, what becomes code? Making sure that that's effective. Thanks, Ben. Eli? Thank you. Um, a few of the challenging things right now, one is that I think our group, we're, we're good at listening and digesting ideas, and the experts in this field are incredibly busy right now. Um, so I know it's hard to listen to the leaders in, um, who, are, who are 
on the ground at protest right now when we're being tasked by the city council to provide some leadership on these issues and some of our experts are um, are, are just overwhelmed. Um, so that's one challenge. Um, also, I think some of the, our hands are tied sometimes as a city because even though so many of the causes of um, displacement and um, segregation and racial policies were explicitly racial when they were adopted. And now because of Supreme Court ruling, we can't use race as a basis for planning recommendations. Um, so we are just to subject to Supreme Court standards, we just can't do racial preference in, in some things that in the past, those racial preferences were used explicitly by government um, to exclude folks. Um, and I, I look back at our comprehensive plan and it's got some good language and equity as Chris mentioned too, but it's kind of reactive. It's like, if you cause it harm, you need to mitigate in some way. It's not proactive in the way this moment really calls for. So um, it, it feels like a little updating is needed to be a little more um, proactively to be racially inclusive and to have racial justice in our planning is not quite captured enough, enough strength in the current context of plan. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of going beyond the, the question Ariana posed, but I'll, I'll just use my time to say that my hope is that we get, after having some experience with RIP and other projects, we get some sort of tool for evaluating social equity and racial justice components, not only of individual projects that we review, but also the selection of projects, which ones should we spend our time on? Um, so I hope that that's an outcome we can, we can get towards through this process. I'll leave it at that, thanks. Great, we have Mike, Katie, Jeff, and Kat on staff. Uh, so go ahead, Mike. Yeah, actually I didn't consider that a softball question. Um, the challenge, I, I have a huge challenge in that um, I, I've been very engaged in all the issues that have, have come before the, the PSC, but obviously my so-called wheelhouse is just overall general ecological health of the, of the city and, and access to nature and access to um, equitable access to parks, um, trails and natural areas. So my challenge is I've got, I mean, my philosophy is I, I, I believe in the intrinsic value of nature without regard to what, it, what nature provides us. That's number one. And number two is kind of a broad ecological philosophy that clean air, clean water, um, access to nature is for everyone. And the more we can do, I think everyone benefits. The challenge, of course, is, well, all right, what does that mean with regard to equity? And I have to say that one of the proudest projects I've worked on in my professional life was back in 94 when we started the Coalition for a Livable Future, where we were very intentional about uh, cross fertilization and, and educating one another in the affordable housing community, uh, jobs with justice community, um, um, Albina Ministerial Alliance and the Urban League. And um, we need to do more of that. I think that's a challenge um, so that we are actually exchanging information and viewpoints. From the ecological perspective, I, I, I bring up, um, yeah, we need to expand urban forest canopy as an example, but there's a very definite equity um, element to that vis-a-vis um, -vis the work that uh, Vivek Shandas has done at, at uh, PSU mapping urban heat islands. So there's the broad issue, broad ecological issue, but it comes down to those communities of color, low-income communities are the ones that are gonna be impacted by climate change much more severely due to um, urban heat islands. So how do we, my ch the challenge I'm thinking of is how do we take both the broader picture, but also then drill down to what kind of actions can we take that relate to um, equity from the perspective of human health and ecological health. Katie? I will say that I actually did read all the articles and um, it, to my mind, one of the hugest issues that came up again and again was the whole concept of building wealth um, and the importance of home ownership. And I think that's what we really need to keep really hammering on increasing wealth among the African-American community, communities of color. And I was also really impressed and I think it, 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 it is uh, missed too frequently that the Native American community, the indigenous communities 
um, are a huge part of the, the conversation as well. Katie? Yeah, I um, you asked what was hard. And um, one of the things is I, I that I the reason why I'm on the commission is because I, I I've been active in East Portland and I really like um, I really think there's something really special about uh, organizing and advocating in a neighborhood. And I, I can't get away from that. So I really want there to be um, coalitions and connection and working together for common goals. And um, I think in, in the, so the, the difficult thing for me right now is that although I, I have a huge respect for what's going on and I support it, uh, absolutely, but there's, it's chaotic and it's strong and there's um, stuff bursting forth and it's, it's calling for change. And, um, and the change is, is, is coming so fast that it's hard to do that kind of work. You know, and I, and I kind of have to let go a little bit, I think, and say, well, let's just see what, see what comes come out of this special moment. But it is hard because I think, well, you know, we could be helping, you know, East Portland Action Plan could be helping with this. Um, I do, I did want to say, though, that I really like that San Francisco thing that you sent out. And, um, and I wanted to say that one of the, one of the things that they were respecting was that neighborhood um, planning. And they were calling it having a, and I wrote it down, it was like a racial and social equity action plans. And, um, you know, that kind of, it kind of sparked something in me because I've been advocating for something called a quadrant plan for East Portland. Nobody knows what the heck what I was talking about when I framed it that way. And um, I was thinking that actually probably I was asking for a racial and social equity action plan for East Portland because I think like, uh, who just said it? Mike. I think a huge amount of that should be economic, you know, economic development for East Portland. And so, um, and I think that that's really what, um, it, I really see that as an area where we could put our money where our mouth is, you know, we're not just saying we're all for a racial equity, but we're actually, making change that actually helps to achieve it. We just have to say less and do more. That's Jeff? Sorry, go ahead, Katie. Jeff? Oh, thank you. Uh, I liked your conclusion, Katie. We need to say less and do more. And it seems like to me, as I'm thinking about those words, we, I think we need to figure out what the outcomes are we can achieve, not just what we want. I mean, I think now the priority for racial equity is obviously a, a top outcome we want to move towards. I don't think, and I think this is a challenge starting with Andrea and her staff and then all of us, how do we plan to achieve certain outcomes. What we do now is how do we manipulate the zoning code to have more infill, good outcome, to have more tree canopy. And so we, we it, but don't really get the outcomes we want. We, we, we spend all our time fine tuning code, it seems like to me, which is someone who's worked on code for years, I'm comfortable doing, but I don't think that's the way we're gonna get at the, the bigger vision issues. And I think, and then that's something uh, I think Steph said about how do we set our priorities? And I think this has been a frustration of mine for most of my years on the commission. I think Eli and I have talked about it. We don't seem to be able to set an agenda. We're always being told, oh, well, we've got to do this project. We've been assigned this project. And so we, we really don't control our destiny when we're always told, you know, and I'm never sure where the decision was made that 
we're going to spend three years working on Doza and you will spend, you know, 50 hours of your life trying to figure out what the right height should be for certain uses. And I know some of you, that's important, and I appreciate that. It's, it's part of the urban fabric. But I got to tell you, my, my mind kind of turned out. And so I think we've got to decide somewhere, and how do we have a process that at the start, everyone kind of says, it's kind of like in legislature, do you have four commissioners signing on to launch this project? Then we don't do it, you know, or something. I'm not sure if that's a good mechanism, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to say what our, what our, how we should structure the new planning bureau and the new planning commission. But I think part of what we're doing is we're going to have, rec we're, and I think we're recognizing it. We got to restructure. I mean, we're, we're not going to get anywhere close to positive outcomes on racial equity unless we redo how we plan. And I'm not sure. I think everyone is saying that. I guess in some ways I'm just repeating it. But I think in doing that, we got to realize we can't do everything. We can't do doza. We can't do tree canopy. We can't, you know, everything, parking, bicycle parking. You know, Chris, I would tell you right now, I would not vote to spend a lot of time on bicycle parking. You know, I don't believe there was a case to be made that with limited priority, yep, that, and I know, I mean, and Chris, I hope, you know, I'm not disparaging that we did it. And I know in some planning vein, it, it was a necessary project, but I think if we're going to, try to get more vision and bigger outcomes, we're going to have to figure out how we can all be collectively more disciplined on, you know what, guys, important project, but majority of the commissioners don't feel like this is something staff and commissions should take a significant amount of time. That's kind of a, I don't know if that gets us there, but I think we, we need to, at the outset, rethink what, what we're going to be spending time on and will it serve racial equity or and, and just sort of one example that, in my mind, is the housing crisis. City Council said, we have a housing crisis. And I think we've definitely done some things motivated towards addressing the housing crisis, RIP being one of the most bigger ones we've done. But I don't think we ever embraced that in a way that said, how do we impact it in a bigger way than some tweaks in the zoning code? In some ways, I think that now that the priority for racial justice is similar. You know, how do we do something more than some tweaks in a zoning code to serve a bigger vision outcome? And we're not good at that. We're not structured to do that. I mean, I think that there's enough brain power to do it, but we're not being presented with a structure that says, okay, let's wrestle with, you know, and I, so, I mean, I'm, I'm all over the place like everybody else, but I think the fundamental thing is we got to restructure how we do planning commission work because we'll bury ourselves. We already do to some extent. I think we, we, you give short shrift sometime to thinking about the future and spend too much time worrying about setbacks and heights and uh, and maybe we maybe those are two different structures maybe there's a zoning code committee that does sort of the pedestrian not sexy big vision stuff and then there's a planning commission that really plans for the future i don't know but obviously we're not structured to tackle outcome based big policy visionary stuff and good luck, Andrea and staff, showing us what that structure looks like because it's not what we got, and change is hard. So, those are my meandering thoughts. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we'll go, Kat, and then I'll jump in and actually build quite a bit off of what Jeff just said. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, Mike returned to stack. So, Mike, uh, we'll go to you uh, for a quick comment, and then I'll ask a closing question that kind of helps weave together. Uh, what folks have said and gives us a little bit of direction for our next few meetings. Uh, so go ahead, Kat. Thanks, Oriana. I, I will keep it brief um, and just it, it, perhaps kind of trying to directly answer your question a little bit is what I challenge with this all white makeup of this commission um, and in all honesty in my leadership of um, running my company and, as well is that I'll, I'll keep it pointed to this commission. It's, it's unintended consequences. It's having the desire to, to be equitable and to do the right thing. And then finding out it was the absolute wrong thing. So it's the messiness of doing the work, right? Um, and I can I speak to um, a couple of different projects that have come through and you know, going back to historic, um, 
injustice that has happened within our neighborhoods. I just had a conversation this weekend with a friend. We were talking about historic neighborhoods in historic Irvington. And um, it's like, well, did you realize that what your deed says? Do you realize that your deed probably says that there are no blacks allowed in your neighborhood? And he was shocked. And, and so he thought we were having a conversation about preserving older homes. And we got into this really deep conversation about all that's tied with it because it's so complicated. And it's a, and I guess so the unintended consequence there being he thought having a historic district was a really great thing for preserving these beautiful old homes without even understanding all the complexities behind that, perhaps. RIP is another one for me that um, has always stood out as an example of potential un unintended consequences. Don't know what they're going to be. I think as a commission, I really feel like we did our did our best to try to do and come to a, a very equitable outcome, but I don't know that we have, and I don't know that it was possible to get the information to make sure that um, we were going down the right path. And you know, we really struggled with um, the question of if we believe this helps more people in the community, is it right? Versus if it help, hurts one person, is it wrong? And, and needing maybe more community direction, meaning not this planning commission, not just city council, but our whole Portland community to help us wrestle with how do we start to answer those questions as we're dealing with trying to, unfortunately, um, I don't want to say pick winners or losers, but try to balance those things because those are difficult questions. And I mean, last but not least, I, I think a lot about the documentary, if you haven't seen it, Priced Out. And the reason I think about that is here was a, a African-American woman very involved in a process in, to create change in her community that today many look back on saying, including her, we did it wrong. But they perhaps did it with the right intention. And so there it's even people within their own community trying to bring change to their community, think they're doing the right things only to find out we didn't we didn't make the right decisions. We created a place that no longer works for our community. So I, it's just a lot to wrestle with. There's a lot of questions and I feel like just not a lot of, um, there's just not a lot of good guidance to guides giving us some of those answers. When you ask the really hard question stuff that you just, just kind of said, you know, what are the tenant cons and intended consequences? What are, what is it we're trying to accomplish? Is this equitable? I think we can all justify a lot of this thinking we really are being equitable, but we really don't know. So that's what my struggle is. And I'll just wrap it up there. Yeah. Thanks all. I think this has been a really valuable um, and uh, kind of transparent and honest conversation. So I just want to um, honor everybody for, for sharing those perspectives and digging into those challenges. You're right, Mike, it's not a softball question to, to go there, but I think it's surfaced some of the big issues that we have. And just looking through some of the notes I took as folks were talking, like Ben, you talked about seismic change. And Jeff, you talked about a bigger vision. Katie named saying less and doing more. Like what does restructuring look like? And um, I think for our final minutes together, I'll let Mike jump back in um, uh, since his hand is raised, but is to really ask the question of what restructuring looks like. And at least from my perspective, um, to answer the question of like, how do we set our priorities? We have our hands tied to a certain extent by what the Bureau is mandated to do on the city level, and then also what our state land use planning goals are. And we need that seismic change in the structures themselves. We need to kind of like really shake the structure and maybe tear it down and rebuild it, which is a lot of what you do in justice work, which is acknowledging that that the system as it's designed was designed to have winners and losers, and in particular to uphold white supremacy as a winner. And in order to do the work the way that it sounds like folks are starting to want to do the work, we we need to really restructure it in a way that it, it serves folks and maybe isn't a square European design building anymore, but has more, more relevance to community and is designed by community. So I think uh, from my perspective, we have to do a couple of things and I'll turn it over to see what other folks think about in terms of the restructuring. But one is we need a new state level land use goal uh, that is focused on racial equity or racial justice. And then the suggestion that I've put forward for this body to consider is going beyond uh, just uh, the resolution and uh, kind of um, 
work that the San Francisco Planning Commission did, uh, but to really restructure our mandate. Um, Jeff, you named like uh, talking about planning for the future and having a committee to plan for the future. In city code, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability is charged with envisioning a future for Portland. If our role, and maybe we are not the right people uh, given kind of our, our whiteness, but if a planning commission or an envisioning the future commission is designed, it is doing that, that fundamental restructuring. And I think it may be valuable for the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to be an example to other bureaus in our city and other bureaus around the nation in terms of really codifying racial justice as a goal and then building in those planning tools that we need and building in those decision-making structures to weigh the benefits and the burdens in our system and to decide what comes before us. Maybe it's not four commissioners saying that a project can move forward, but a community oversight body or some connection to community who is driving what the work looks like and rebuilding the structure in a way that is really meaningful. Um, so I'll get off my soapbox there, but I'm really excited by the energy in this commission and the opportunity to continue this conversation and to, to start really uh, building together and, and dismantling, which is a word we use a lot in justice work. We're starting to dismantle this and we have the opportunity to dismantle it in a way that community can rebuild. Um, so does anybody wanna share your thoughts on what restructuring looks like or some of the challenges we may encounter in that restructuring? And we have about four minutes left, so you may be our final thought. Well, I'm just going to agree with Jeff and with your recapitulation of what, what the conversation is. I, I got on, uh, agreed to serve on the PSE um, when it became the Planning and Sustainability Commission. And I, I, my soapbox has been for quite some time that we shouldn't be, somebody has to talk about height, somebody has to talk about how far the setback is. We need to do that. But we also need, I think, to take the broader view and look at our ability to not do everything within the confines of our meetings. There are many other things we could be doing in the community that are not at 1900 Southwest 4th. And I, I, I feel strongly about that. Uh, I didn't see who jumped in first, but maybe Steph and Jeff for quick comments. And I know Andrea, you're maybe wanting to close us out. Uh, Steph, I think you're muted. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, you know, I, I, Oriana, I hear uh, what I heard in, in your statement um, that really spoke to me was like, how do we give up power? Um, and how do we cede that uh, um, to community? And um, I think a, a lot about the, the recent conversation with uh, Hockey and Unite Oregon about um, that their conversation around like that they're the community experts and they're stymied by kind of like the technocracy of, you know, just not knowing the words, like these specialized um, phrases, you know, in, in transportation, there's a lot of acronyms that I think really prevent people. Um, so how do we, uh, how do we restructure a body? Um, this would be my dream um, to, to restructure a body so that, you know, as, as we're com having conversations um, that are community specific, um, that, that those communities who have convened around that actually have the decision-making capacity and that, um, uh, and that the commissioners have a diminutized role, honestly, or, you know, a revolving role or, uh, I have other thoughts. I would say, yeah, how do we, how do we seed authority? Jeff, were you wanting to jump in again, or uh, can we kick okay. it over? Yeah. All right, Andrea. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. This was a really rich conversation, and I think it was a great um, starter conversation for the, uh, the work ahead. I agree that it's really kind of restructuring the work and, and really um, uh, uh, breaking down kind of the systems and figuring out how do we, how do we change Kind of the way in which we're approaching um, uh, the conversation in the first place and who is at the table. And I think, Kat, to your, your um, reflections on kind of the challenge of 
how do you address kind of unintended consequences? I think the way that we do that is really to create, um, do the work collaboratively with community, to co-create with community. And I think that there are a number of places where we're doing that at BPS now from our anti-displacement work, uh, the Zero Cities Coalition work on energy efficiency for buildings um, and reducing an energy burden for, um, for residents the work that we're doing um, in East Portland that's getting underway in this next year. It's a uh, collaborative with Unite to help um, really kind of envision and prioritize what is what is that, I think Katie, as you put it, the racial and social equity plan for East Portland. I think that's absolutely kind of what we, where we need to go. And, um, you know, the way that we avoid those unintended consequences is to bring the people who are most impacted at the table and making it accessible, as Steph is saying, like making sure that the barriers of, whether it's the, the laws and the rules aren't, aren't barriers that prevent people from really engaging. Um, and, uh, and then that we make this commission more accessible, uh, not only to community members, but you know, the, that, it, that this commission, I think part of our structural changes are the, the makeup of our commission really needs to change ultimately, that we need to make sure that people who are directly impacted are part of that um, decision-making, part of the power um, process um, for land use and planning uh, in the city. So I think this is a really important conversation. I think um, the uh, looking at kind of how do we fundamentally change and structure kind of our purpose and our role and looking at our title, you know, title three is absolutely where, where we need to be focused. Um, I love the idea of thinking more about statewide as well. And I think there's some new leadership at the state uh, DLCD that would be open to that. And so I think that's a place where um, BPS can really um, explore and, and be a, an a important change agent as well. Um, I think what's most important right now is um, that we not let this moment pass without really making that transformative change, without dismantling kind of the old way and building new ways, new approaches that share and deliver and prioritize delivering benefits for the communities in our um, in Portland that have been harmed, that have gone without for a long time. So um, I appreciate the conversation and look forward to the continued work and future sessions that we have on this. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Oriana, for taking the time and facilitating our first of more discussions on this. And some action, too. I'm now going to shift gears for us. We've got a packed next couple hours coming up. So um, I'd like to invite Sally to um, take the baton as we shift to the um, South Reach plan and, um, and say farewell to Kat, who's going to have to exit for this portion of the, the meeting. Um, We've got homelessness briefing on South Reach, river recreation, public hearing, and then we'll go to some deliberations and some straw polls and voting, I hope. So um, I'll pass it to Sally to introduce the team and take it from here. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, uh, good afternoon. Sally Edmonds with Planning and Sustainability. Um, Jeff Cottle and Debbie Bischoff are uh, with me today, and I'm hoping Jeff will um, uh, power up our PowerPoint. Uh, presentation. Um, I have uh, uh, the first slide is an overview of, of what we're like planning to do hey, today. Hey, Julie, it's not letting me share my screen. Can you? Oh, here we go. Thank you. Sorry, Kelly. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So um, this is our agenda for today. Um, as Eli said, we're starting out with a briefing and discussion on houselessness. We have a couple of special guests who uh, Debbie will introduce in just a minute. Then we'll move into a public hearing on river recreation. And um, once we hear testimony, we'll, um, the PSC will have a discussion about that. Then we'll move into um, a discussion of a few amendments and uh, some straw polls related to enforcement. That's a follow-up from last time. Uh, and then there are a couple of other minor amendments related to uh, design. Um, and then we're hoping uh, that uh, you will want to take a vote on the, uh, on the package of River Plan Southreach as amended. 
um, and we'll talk about the transmittal letter and next steps. So um, on Friday, June 12th, you received uh, by email a number of, uh, of materials, a cover memo, memo on houselessness that includes information related to uh, what we'll hear tonight. Um, another memo on river recreation and on some of the amendments. So um, I hope you have those um, handy and um, I'll turn it over to Debbie Bischoff. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Um, this top, the topic of houselessness in the South Reach has been of interest to planning staff, government bureaus, and agencies, the public and this commission. There are humanitarian concerns about the, on the treatment of and services for houseless people, public safety concerns as expressed, for example, by trail users along the Springwater Corridor, and environmental concerns about adverse impacts of camping and liveaboard boaters on natural resources. The South Reach Plan looks forward to the ongoing coordination between the city and county through the Joint Office of Homeless Services and other organizations and the community. It will take bringing everyone together to compassionately address this unfortunate and complex situation. The PSC asked for a briefing on houselessness in the South Reach. And we thank Sarah Fee Allen from the mayor's office, Mark Jolin, director of the city county joint office of homeless services and Justin Russell from the Oregon department of state lands for their willingness to discuss this important topic with you this evening. And I'm not sure if Seraphie is, is here, um, but I know that um, Mark is ready to speak and Justin is also available. Um, you have in your packet a memo um, uh, that contains background information provided by Seraphie, Justin, and a news release from the Department of State Lands. Without further ado, I wanna introduce to you Mark Jolin, Director of the Joint Office of Homeless Services, who will begin this briefing. Mark? Hi, it's nice to be here. Um, can I just, in turn, Eli, how much time is allocated to, to this part of the discussion? We have about 20 to 25 minutes for the whole discussion. Okay, and is Seraphie with us? Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to, to cover both the uh, social services side and some of the um, impact mitigation efforts that the city undertakes. So I'm Mark Jolin. I'm the director of the Joint Office of Homeless Services for the city of Portland and Multnomah County. I use he, him, his pronouns. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I don't want to speak at great length because I imagine you have some specific questions and I, I want to leave time for that. Um, the memo that Seraphie provided you, I think, does a does a good job of kind of touching on the highlights um, of, uh, of our sort of community's coordinated response to, to homelessness. Um, I think since we're talking about the South Reach area, uh, we're actually talking about a, a relatively um, specific subset of people experiencing homelessness in our community. That experience looks very different in different communities. Um, the South Reach conversation is largely one about unsheltered um, individuals uh, disproportionately a population of single adult households, um, disproportionately folks who are going to be longer term uh, homeless and, and struggling with one or more significant disabilities that may be a physical disability, a behavioral health issue, um, a substance use disorder. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a group of folks who we often um, refer to as chronically homeless. That's really a federal term um, that is defined in, in regulation as, as someone who's been homeless for a year or longer um, or has had multiple episodes of homelessness over a, a multi-year period and has one or more significant life-limiting disabilities um, that's impacting their, their um, opportunities to get out of homelessness. In that, um, in, in that part of the population, um, we, in the 2019 point in time count, identified around 2,000 people who were unsheltered. Um, a significant majority of those are adult-only households. We had very few families who were identified as, as sleeping out um, on that, that night. 
of the count, um, and it is a point in time count. So it's it's going out and spending a week determining who was sleeping outside or in a shelter or in transitional housing on a, on a particular evening um, during that week, and then documenting um, uh, a, a range of sort of demographic um, facts about each of those individuals um, who, who were able to identify. So um, in addition to there being about 2,000 and primarily being adults, um, it is disproportionately a population uh, made up of different communities of color. Um, that's true across all types of homelessness and houselessness in our community. Um, it's even more true in the family population, but um, among adults, uh, African Americans are significantly overrepresented. Native Americans are particularly significantly overrepresented you're about um, four times more likely to be experiencing homelessness in our community if you're Native American than if you're white. Um, we also see overrepresentation in the um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community um, as well as in the Latinx community. Um, within the chronically homeless population, the rates of overrepresentation are particularly high for Native Americans again and for um, African Americans. Um, we, we saw about a 37% increase in chronic homelessness over a two-year period. The total um, HUD homeless population, folks staying outside in shelter or transitional housing, um, actually only rose by a couple of percentage points um, over the last four years. But, but the chronic homeless popula chronically homeless population has grown dramatically. So we saw a 37% increase in that population between 2017 and 2019. Um, and within that, we saw even higher rates of increase of chronic homelessness among African Americans. And um, Native Americans actually have the, the highest rate of chronic homelessness of any population, including the white population. So uh, that's, that is largely who um, uh, we have sort of unsheltered in our community. Um, the vast majority of our chronic homeless population is unsheltered, uh, despite lots of efforts to expand shelter capacity and remove barriers to access to shelter for people who have been homeless for a long time and are struggling with disabling conditions. Um, but it still is the case uh, that about 70% of the chronic population is unsheltered in our community. Um, and, uh, and they do make up a significant majority of the unsheltered population as well at this point. So. That's, that's sort of numerically the overview of, of where we are. I'll stop and, and answer any questions you may have about the sort of demographics of who we're, who we're um, seeing in, in areas like the South Reach. Yeah. Um, hi, Mark. Thanks for joining us hi. today and for sure. sharing uh, some really valuable information. I know you've got a lot on your plate right now. Um, I'm curious what kinds of culturally specific solutions, you just talked about the demographics that are really, really striking and especially in context of the conversation we just had, um, what culturally specific solutions are available and in particular, as we consider this South Reach conversation, um, what could we potentially do as a commission to help to amplify that through land use work or through the things that are under our purview? Hard for me to answer the second half of that question. I can answer the first half better. Um, so, so in in all of the areas that that we do work through the joint office, that's in the system of care for families, for domestic violence survivors, for youth and adults. Um, we have a very intentional strategy of investing in culturally specific provider organizations that deliver the range of services that are needed in that system. Um, for the unsheltered population in the last uh, several years in particular, we've expanded our investments in culturally specific outreach so that we have um, outreach workers working through the Urban League, through NARA, and through El Programa Hispano um, that are specifically focused on engaging the communities that, that they, their organizations are, are set up to serve. Um, and that is, of course, just the starting point of the engagement. So um, beyond that, the organizations are then resource to provide assistance with transitions out of unsheltered homelessness um, into various forms of transitional services and ultimately permanent housing. Um, and for the chronically homeless population, that housing tends to look um, most commonly like long-term, deeply subsidized, um, affordable housing for you know, that rents to, to folks who have 30% of the area median income or below, plus a, a range of wraparound services. And that, that can be um, addiction services, it can be mental health services, physical health services, employment services, um, just basic social support and housing retention assistance. And 
in that area as well. We're making investments in culturally specific providers um, and, and ensuring that we can provide that, um, the wraparound services to um, folks based on the communities that they feel most identified with. So that, that continuum of culturally specific service provision is, is there and growing. Um, I will say that on the singles side, the adult only household side is where we've had the least targeted investment um, for culturally specific services. The, the county board actually just um, adopted its budget today. Um, we requested an, an additional million dollars of ongoing funding to expand culturally specific services in, on, in the adult system of care. Um, the board approved that um, as, as the first million dollars. Um, there's, a, there's a commitment to, to growing those investments beyond, um, beyond that first million. And certainly with Here Together funding coming, there's going to be in, uh, an even more urgent need and opportunity to significantly grow the investments in culturally specific providers that are serving the adult chronic, uh, chronic homeless population. So the, I think in terms of where you go with that, I think the continued advocacy, the recognition that that's critical, that culturally specific services at every step of the way is important. So we need culturally specific behavioral health services, housing retention and support services, we need the outreach work, um, and we need to make sure that all of our mainstream organizations are culturally responsive, right? So that they also need to be environments that are welcoming um, and are serving communities of color well. So that's that's the start of an answer. Um, it's a, it's something we spend a lot of time in conversation with community about and ways in which that we can enhance enhance those services um, for the groups that are overrepresented the most in the system. Are there additional questions for Mark? What's that? Oh, I'm asking fellow commissioners if there are more questions for you. Okay. So I can, is that Jeff Wang in? Mark? Yeah, no, Steph has a question. Sorry. Okay. Um, I, and I, I want to echo with Oriana. Thank you so much. Like I know that, and you, you were here last month too, and we just blew past the time. So um, no problem. thank you. Uh, um, from from what you know of, uh, specific to to the South Reach plan, um, curious um, what you see as opportunities for um, for ensuring partnership and some cohesion. Uh, we talk a lot about safety, um, and and I think of um, uh, safety within our unhoused communities um, to ensure that that. Um, that they aren't the victims of, of um, sweeps that, that harm their ability to um, continue to sustain themselves? Uh, yeah, so um, in one sense, there's nothing unique about the South Reach, right? I, I mean, it is, it is another public space that um, people who are houseless in our community are needing to use for purposes of just sustaining themselves because there isn't a better option for them right now in the community. And, and we see that whether it's the South Reach or the Peninsula Crossing or any number of other places, green spaces, sidewalks. And so, you know, the strategies, the strategies that, that we use to address the challenge in South Reach are not really going to be different than the ones that, that we're using community wide. Um, it starts with engagement, um, connecting people um, to supports that will allow them to move from wherever they are today, whether that's outside in an encampment or sleeping in a vehicle or sleeping in a shelter bed um, to the to the supports and, the, and largely relational supports and then also whatever professional services that they need to kind of walk that path from that point back into permanent housing. And um, all of our systems of care are built around that that basic notion that we're, we're endeavoring to offer a, a, a very much sort of person-centered, tailored to the individual opportunity for support that's sustained through whatever those transition processes are that someone needs to go through until they get to, to a permanent housing situation. And, and you know, unfortunately, um, as much desire as there is among every single outreach worker and every single housing case manager in the, in the system to provide that to every single person who's out there, there just isn't anywhere near the capacity for it. Um, we just especially on the housing side of this equation, and I'm sure you all grapple with this all the time, um, but we would have more than enough outreach capacity and more than enough shelter capacity if we had enough housing capacity, right? The, the bottleneck is the absence of deeply affordable housing 
with the necessary support services, at least for the subset of the population for whom that's vital. Um, and absent that, we are going to continue to back up um, at every stage. And, and ultimately, we're going to continue to have people sleeping in encampments in the South Reach. Um, if you know, we can take measures to reduce that, we can create additional shelter capacity, we can innovate, innovate around what shelter looks like and provide outdoor sanctioned encampments like we're doing right now in response to COVID-19. And none of those solve anybody's homelessness, right? And none of them are effective unless they are only a short-term waypoint on, on a path to permanent housing. And right now, that, that system is not working very well. So we've seen, you know, we've created um, uh, about 700 units, setting aside what we've been doing with COVID, about 700 new units of shelter in the last five years in this community. Um, and shelter stays are increasing. Um, in duration because we are filling those beds and because there is no housing for people to move into, those beds stay full and very quickly the shelter the shelter stays grow again. And that's true across our spectrum in every type of shelter we have right now. Um, so I think um, you know I, I think in the in the very immediate term, um, and this is where the conversation about sweeps becomes difficult because you have people who have really no choice but to be living their private lives in these public spaces that weren't designed for that. Um, the city is going to great lengths through their urban camping impact reduction program to try to support people in mitigating the impacts of their camping while they're outside through trash pickup services and things like that. And when, when a situation becomes too too difficult to manage, right? The group has grown large, the impact is too high, then the city does send out a posting process and asks people to move and then cleans up. And, and that is disrupting and it is destabilizing. And there isn't, there isn't a simple solution to that, to needing to resolve that dynamic. And that's true in the South Reach. It's, it's true in, in all of our public spaces. So, you know, they're really important conversations always about is the balance right? Are the processes the best they can be? But there isn't a simple, inexpensive, well, we could just do X to solve that problem better. Our shelters are expensive. To provide quality care in a shelter environment, even the tent camps that we have, that we've set up as part of COVID, are, are costing a substantial amount of money because you have to provide enough basic care and safety to everyone staying there. So, you know, we won't, we won't get out of this by just expanding shelter capacity. We, we've got to expand the housing capacity in the system and ultimately that will be more cost effective right because you know this likely that you know while people are still homeless whether in and out of shelter or just staying outside um the costs to the community of that actually exceed what it would cost to pay rent and support services for the vast majority of those folks so we've got to get there and i'll i'll say here together the the metro services measure is is large enough that it will finally allow us to make a, a meaningful impact for this particular subset of the population. So going forward over the next several years, it won't just be a trade-off. Do I have an outreach worker? Do I have a shelter bed? Do we have another housing unit? We're actually gonna be able to invest in the housing into that continuum and to the extent necessary, those other elements as well. And I think really start to have a, a positive impact in part because it's not just Multnomah County, it's, it's Clackamas and Washington too. And they have had no resources to invest um, in, in these types of interventions for this chronically homeless population. Now they do. And so I, I think it's transformative for our region and, and will actually make a big difference in our ability to, to avoid sweeps and instead offer services that can actually move someone, not just to a different location, but to housing. Thank you. I've got a note from Jeff and Jeff, jump in. No, oh, I lowered my hand. I just, oh, you did. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, my question will lead us even further into a discussion about housing and homelessness that really doesn't isn't the right time to pick up South Reach with anymore. I mean, it's uh, so anyway. Thank you for coming, Mark. And I'd only put you on the spot with my questions, and they're not relevant to South Reach. So I'm I'm here to take your questions, whatever you want to talk about. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. I will mention that. Um, Mark's office, I believe, has been involved in an upcoming housing continuum code project, which um, will be coming to us. Um, I'm not sure where, the, where it is, but later this year, I believe. Um, so we may have some stuff within Title 33 that we can do to support that work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think that touches on on all elements of the of the continuum, the sheltering strategies as well as the the permanent housing options. So, great. Well, I'm not seeing more questions, and knowing we've got 37 people waiting to testify, I will say thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. And um, I'm seeing hands raised though. So, um, Debbie. Well, I was just wondering, um, since Justin Russell is here from the Department of State Lands, and I know Mike, you had concerns about. Um, live aboard boaters and all that. I didn't know whether um, you would like to hear from Justin while he's with us today. Well, since he's here, um, he took the time to be here. If you could pr provide us a, a brief um, information, that'd be great. Thank you. Justin, I, I see your name, but not your face, but welcome to our meeting. And if you could share, take a couple minutes to share what's happening, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Justin Russell. I'm a proprietary coordinator for the Department of State Lands. What that means is I'm responsible for managing the state's proprietary interest in the city of Portland. Um, so the state owns uh, title to the bed and banks of the Willamette River, the Columbia River, Multnomah Channel, and of course, a number of other bodies, water bodies throughout the state. Um, so our agency really comes uh, to the South Reach from kind of an ownership perspective. Um, we, um, we have rules that kind of limit what isn't and isn't allowed on state owned property. Um, and things like live aboard boating or parking a boat just in a one place over a period of time, um, is something that generally needs authorization. That's usually something that someone will get a lease for or some kind of permit to do. Um, obviously there's a lot of boats in the South reach. Um, that don't have those kind of authorizations for the state. Um, I put together a, a bit of a kind of briefing on kind of the issues that our department faces in the South Reach, and I think Debbie forwarded that to everyone. Um, but in, in the South Reach, I think you guys, many of you are probably aware that the majority of the, the live aboard vessels are kind of parked out around Ross Island. Um, that portion where those barts, boats are parked, that's a kind of an abnormal area where Ross Island, a, a private company, actually owns the bed of the waterway. So the state of Oregon's jurisdiction and ability to enforce in that area, is, it doesn't exist. Um, and so in the South Reach, our department faces a lot of kind of unique challenges because vessels who may be parked out in the waterway on state-owned property um, if we make any attempt to post them for seizure or ask them to move, oftentimes they just kind of hopscotch back and forth between private and public land. Um, and it really complicates enforcement for our agency. Um, to date, Ross Island Sand and Gravel hasn't been interested in pur pursuing any kind of civil trespass against those vessels. Um, and I can't speak to exactly why that is, but um, until they are willing or able to take action on their part. I think that the issues uh, around people living on vessels in the South Reach is gonna, is gonna persist. Um, I see Mike has a question. Well, actually just a comment. That's, that's why um, in our recommendations on the South Reach, there is, I know I've, I've presented um, a recommendation that we investigate how, how the state can reclaim um, ownership. I mean, it's it's a real anomaly. I, I don't know if there are any other examples anywhere in the Willamette River other than Ross Island. So it's something that I hope we can all work on to to rectify. Yeah, absolutely. I think our agency is definitely interested in finding something that works better for everyone because what's right. working, what's happening right now, isn't working. Obviously. Yeah. Thanks for your input. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. And Jeff, do you have a question? Seeing a hand up, but not hearing, I will. Okay, yeah, no, my hand's still up from before. Okay, Sorry. great. Okay, thanks. Um, great, any other questions for Mark or Justin? Okay, well, thank you so much for both of you for joining us in this meeting and um, completely go on to whatever your, your evening plans include. Thank you. Thank you all for having us. Yeah. So unless Debbie or Sally have something else to do, I will switch gears to our public hearing on the South Reach.
Okay, so welcome, and I'm speaking specifically to the so far 39 and counting people who've signed up to participate in this meeting. Thank you for spending your, your time to join us here. Um, this public hearing is about the River Plan South Reach, which is a long range plan for the riverfront area that updates the City of Portland's 1987 Willamette Greenway plan. The proposed draft that this commission has been reviewing includes a vision for the future, policy guidance, and a list of implementation actions, zoning code mapping, code changes, and natural resources and scenic resources protection plans. There are four key topics in this plan, the watershed, health, and resilience, recreation, tribal engagement and collaboration, and riverfront communities. And tonight we're focusing on recreation and specifically in river recreation and boating. This draft plan has been publicly available for review and comments since January 16th. For this planning project, BPS held 63 public meetings, events, and public input opportunities over the past two years attended by over 960 community members and government representatives. This commission held a February 25th public hearing and 64 people commented on the River Plan South Reach proposed draft. This plan and recent changes made by the commission at subsequent work sessions following the hearing have been shaped by this public input. We are providing an additional opportunity tonight for folks to share their thoughts with us on river recreation. Southreach is the hub for a variety of in-river recreation, and this plan addresses existing and future issues and opportunities. Additionally, this plan makes a number of recommendations to improve conditions for motorized watercraft and light watercraft, including dock improvements at Selwood River Front Park and identifying a location for gas refueling and pump out station. Central to the PSC's mission is to ensure the city plans are consistent with and implement the citywide comprehensive plan and the climate action plan. This takes thoughtful consideration of many important topics and can lead to recommendations that balance different goals and objectives. Our job is to make recommendations to City Council. City Council takes the final action on plans after holding a public hearing with additional testimony taken. Before we get started, I want to make one observation about the, test, the written testimony that we've received. Much of it is focused on boating rules and the speed zone in the river, which indicates that there may be a misunderstanding about uh, or circulating. The City of Portland does not have any authority related to boating or establishing speed zones. As you'll hear in a moment from staff, that is the purview of the Oregon Strait Marine Board. Also, there are no specific boating rule recommendations in the plan. There is a recommendation for the city to partner with OSMB, the Oregon State Marine Board, and others to pursue boater safety, education, and enforcement on the river. So, because so many of you have taken the time commitment to comment on the Marine Board's rules, we will forward your comments to the Marine Board so that they have the benefit, in addition to us, for all the work that you've done in the body with authority. And that goes to the, this, the official body with the authority on this issue. The South Reach plan does include recommendations related to docks and boating facilities, but very little submitted testimonies related to the plan itself, which is the topic of this hearing. When you testify, we ask you to focus your comments on the river plan and South Reach recommendations. While I personally prefer paddling and swimming in the river, I've enjoyed jet skiing and other forms of motorized boating as well. My role as the chair of the PSC is to be even-handed in the way I lead the commission. I recognize that motorized boating is an active recreation activity in the South Reach that is important to many people. To be clear, the South Reach plan does not formally prioritize one boating type over another and does include facility improvements for both motorboat users and non-motorized boat users. There seems to be some misunderstanding about that as well. After listening to the testimony, the PSC plans to consider any final amendments and then vote the South Reach plan forward to City Council. Our practice is to also prepare a transmittal letter that explains our recommendation and that sometimes includes additional recommendations for City Council to consider informed by our public process. Now I'd like to have planning staff provide a brief overview of the jurisdictional roles and responsibilities related to river recreation, including boating, highlight relevant plans and policies, and share key objectives and recommendations for river recommendation for river recreation as laid out in the South Beach plan. And after that, we'll have a public hearing. People can make comments specifically on river recreation as relates to the South Beach plan. And this will be followed by the commission discussing among ourselves um, this topic that we'll cover this evening. And right now I'll turn it over to Debbie Bishop. Good evening again, commissioners. Uh, yes, Jeff is bringing back our PowerPoint. So this is, um, I'm just going to provide a brief overview. Um, this is kind of, again, what um, Chair Spivak just mentioned. Um, after the overview, we'll have testimony, hearing closes, and the commission will discuss the testimony. Next slide, please. 
So there are numerous uh, federal, state, and local agencies that have a role in the uses, development, and activities associated with the Willamette River. To provide context for today's hearing, I will mention a few agencies that play a significant role in the Southreach area in regard to in-river recreation. The Oregon Department of State Lands owns beds and banks of the Willamette River and manages and issues permits for uses, development, and activities. An example is a lease agreement for a dock. The Oregon State Marine Board is responsible for recreational boating safety, including rulemaking, education, licensing, and grant funding for boating facilities. The Marine Board, as many of you know, um, is currently considering new boating regulations in the Lower Willamette, and that includes the Southreach area. They have revised a draft proposal currently out for review with comments due on June 29th. The Department of Land Conservation and Development provides policy direction for managing urban growth under its statewide land use planning program. There are 19 statewide planning goals that governments must be consistent with and implement in their jurisdictional planning. Two noteworthy planning goals for tonight's discussion are Goal 15, the Willamette River Greenway, and Goal 8, Recreational Needs. Goal 15 in particular seeks to protect, conserve, enhance, and maintain the natural scenic, historical, agricultural, economic, and recreational qualities of lands along the river. Next slide. Multnomah County and the city of Portland also have roles related to river recreation. The county sheriff's office river patrol is the primary enforcer of law laws associated with river recreation and uses, including speed limits, boater safety and length of stay in one location. The river patrol works in partnership with Portland police and Portland fire and rescue among other agencies. Portland Parks and Rec is responsible for the planning, development, operations, and maintenance of public recreation facilities along the river. Examples are Willamette and Selwood Riverfront Parks that have boat docking and launching facilities. The Portland Bureau of Planning and Sustainability leads the city's long-range planning and sustainability agenda, coordinates with government bureaus and agencies at all levels to ensure consistency with and implementation of planning and climate change policy mandates. The River Plan Southeast is an example of a community planning effort that addresses policy mandates and guidance. Thank you. The River Plan Southreach um, that the PSC is reviewing further furthers and implements statewide planning goals, the recently adopted citywide 2035 comprehensive plan and other local plans, policies and programs. An example of a local plan is the Willamette Park Phasing and Redevelopment Plan. In addition to statewide planning goal, there are numerous 2035 comprehensive plan policies that guide River Plan Southreach. All in all, planning policies must be considered in concert and recommendations must be supported by findings that show how they balance the different and sometimes competing outcomes. Next, please. Not all plan recommendations, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, River Plan Southreach proposed draft includes a vision and illustration for on land and in river recreation in 20 years. And this is the first uh, part of that urban design concept. Uh, the second part is on the next slide. This plan is, um, and I just want to state that the plan is a result of numerous public meetings and events, as the chair mentioned, um, that serves as the basis for the community input in this illustration and the rest of the plan. For river recreation, the priorities are about improving conditions um, to accommodate a mix of recreational users and activities, providing recreational facilities and services that contribute to recreation that contribute to the health and well being of all ages and abilities, enhancing river access points, and overall building upon the South Reach as a fish and wildlife habitat, a recreation amenity for riverfront neighborhoods and others. Next slide, please. The plan contains recreation objectives, and there are five objectives that support and address different river recreation activities. 
under each of these objectives are action items um, that are proposed to be completed in the next 20 years. City bureaus, other agencies, community organizations, and others all have a role in the success of plan implementation. This slide illustrates actions that relate to re recreational boating. They include improvements, improving existing facilities and planning for new ones. One action looks as, again, Chair Spivak said, looks at a boat fueling station and pump out station in the South Reach. Not all plan recommendations are action items for projects, programs, and activities. Here are two other implementation items noted. Next. Okay, before you hear testimony this evening, I just wanna provide you a brief summary of the public testimony that we've received via um, our MAP app. Um, and it's been quite amazing. Um, let me just grab my summary here. Okay, as of five o'clock tonight, we received 890 submissions of written testimony. Nearly all of it is on voting regulations. And again, as the chair said, most people it seems did not review the Southreach plan because there's not a recommendation for a slow wake, no wake zone in the plan. The testimony received is from a broad spectrum of boat users from wakeboarders to paddle boarders, from fisher people and swimmers too. Some folks enjoy both motorized and non-motorized boating activities on the river. Some testimony emphasized the need for more education for all river users and the need for enforcement of rules. We were able to review 70% of the testimony received or 606 submissions. 68% of those supported a slow no wake zone, 31% were against a slow no wake zone, a few of whom favored a compromised approach. Those supporting less regulations and not supportive of a slow no wake zone cited the river should be for all users. A slow no wake zone would force motor boaters to other areas, adding congestion at those locations. The slow no wake zone as proposed is too large an area. Some said don't prioritize light watercraft over motorized boats. For light watercraft users, their biggest concern was with boats that produce large wakes and concerns for capsizing, injuries, and damages to watercraft. We heard from a lot of non-motorized boating cl club members. We heard from families on the river desiring to feel safe while recreating. Some testifiers are concerned about turbidity, erosion, and fish habitat. Others cited concerns for wave energy damaging floating homes. Some folks wanna see a slow no wake zone from Hawthorne Bridge to city limits in the south or to Elk Rock Island. So that summarizes um, the testimony. Um, I'd like to now turn it back to Chair Spivak. Thank you, Debbie, so much for that summary and um, distilling feedback from so many um, Portland residents who one thing may be in common among them and us is that it'd be nice to be on the river right now, one way or the other, on a sunny, hot day. Yes. So I will now switch over to public testimony and each person will have one minute and a half. So I will be strict by that. Um, I've got my old fashioned stopwatch here because my phone keeps beeping. And, um, and I'll put my hand up when you got 15 minutes left, 15 seconds left, sorry that is. And I will try not to resort to the ultimate thing, which is to turn someone's mute on, but hopefully I won't have to do that. So let's begin now. The first three people will be um, Judy Todd, Jeff Todd, and Mo Dindral. And I apologize ahead of time if I mangle your name, but please start with your name. And um, let's start with Judy. Great, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I'm not related to Jeff, so do not hold me accountable for any remarks he makes after me. <laughs> so there you go. Um, okay, so um, I didn't know I had anything to say about this and I was just gonna pass on my time. However, as I listened to all the process of this whole question about boating, et cetera, et cetera, what I'm left with is that nowhere in there is climate change mentioned. Nowhere in there <clears throat> is there primary interest in protecting the river for all people and all the creatures over the long haul. So my testimony is really 
get gas powered engines off the river. What are we doing? We're trying to get them off the roads. We're trying to reduce climate change. I mean, climate uh, chaos. We're trying to get away from fossil fuel industry. What the heck are we doing? Encouraging, allowing, and continuing to capitulate anything to gas powered engines. It's insane. And I'm sure, and I know that there are electric engines that could be used on boats. So I'm not against boating. I come from a long line of people on the river fishing and doing all kinds of boating. Thank you, Eli. Thanks. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, and Jeff, Todd, not related. I don't see him listed here. Uh, but, okay, well now I'll, I'll flag that and come back if need be. Um, Mo Dindro. Hello, how are you doing? My name is Mo Dindro. Uh, I've spoken to you before. It's nice to meet you guys all again. My, my, my really concern is about the Greenway Review and the water and the process that you have to go through, how complicated it is and how expensive it is. If you're a professional builder or a developer, they're chump change. But if you're a homeowner that lives by the river and you have to go through a Greenway Review, you cannot imagine what it's like to go through the Bureau of Development so Services. It I is I have it to absolutely mind-boggling the cost and the process and the technocratic language that they understand. Most people don't. We need somebody to advocate for homeowners, property owners, uh, regular people that own homes along the Greenway Belt that, are, uh, that get involved with, uh, with the Greenway Review. We really need to understand what the costs are. My costs alone were close to $15,000. I couldn't imagine that it would have gotten to that, to that point for all the stuff that I had to produce to go through that Greenway review. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mo. Now I'm running off the list that I had printed off previously. So if that's changed, maybe um, Julie could educate me. But I now have next Matt Radich. And then after that, Ryan Whitney and Trevor Graves. So Matt. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Matt Radich. I'm actually the president of Active Water Sports. We are a Portland towboat dealer. Uh, our Portland location is right down there on McAdam in that really South Reach area. Uh, my concerns overall with this, um, you know, slow no wake zones, all those are really kind of down the line. My, my big concern is just the, the um, the procedures that have gone into place. You made some about how many meetings you had and how, uh, how much access people have had to all this information and how many people have talked about it. Well, as a, as a business that's run in right in that area that will be greatly impacted because we sell tow boats, which you say it's not part of the South Reach plan, but I know you guys sent a letter to the Marine Board requesting that uh, no wake zone. So we'll be greatly affected by that. So, and I sent in a list of, uh, there's probably 15 or 20 tow boat dealers or powerboat dealers in the Portland area. Did anyone from that group send a letter to them saying, hey, these are some of the things we're looking at. Of the 160,000 registered powerboat users in Oregon, was there any notes sent out to those people? Hey, your recreation might be impacted by this. Do you have any input? So that's, that's really all I wanna to say today is that I want a little more um, outreach and, to the different user groups done here before decisions are made that are gonna affect a lot of people that you haven't talked with. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. And I'm glad that you and others are coming into this public testimony here. And as I mentioned, this goes to city council next. So there's additional opportunities ahead of us. Um, I'm going to go now to Ryan Whitney. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, first off, I, I would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to my testimony here. Um, when it comes to um, one of my favorite recreational places, uh, I get, get very concerned when I hear about these kind of uh, no wake zones in this area being uh, passed. I've been enjoying this area for nearly 40 years and I've passed this boating bug onto my uh, own child. Uh, I consider myself to be a very avid seasoned boater and um, I take all the rules of the river uh, very seriously. Uh, along with my other friends who enjoy and, and own uh, power boats, we have been using this portion of the river for uh, uh, decades, pretty much unopposed. I'd like to bring up maybe some uh, observations that and bring up some concerns that I have. Um, 
ski boats and pleasure crafts have been operating in this section of the river uh, long before paddle boarders um, have been out there. Um, that doesn't mean we should be able to share the river uh, with non-motorized uh, floating toys, but uh, not sure why it's being proposed that we're kicked out of the area uh, we've been enjoying so long. So I'd like to mention we also pay a lot of money to keep our boats in that area, and we help fund the boat ramp and the docks, and we register our boats. Uh, many of the facilities um, and docks wouldn't be there if it wasn't uh, for us that, that paddle boarders use. Um, anyway, I would like to also mention that this section of the river is now being proposed to be closed to water sports, happens to be a shipping channel, and it's on the maps. Although the river problem. Can wrap up the air if you could? Is that... I'm sorry, what's that? Well, yeah, I took that note, but thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. All right. Um, that was right. So um, and next I have Trevor Graves. And after Trevor, we have Raj Savara and John Clinton. So Trevor. I appreciate everything that you folks are doing. I'm just tuning in for the first time to see how this process uh, actually works. Welcome. And it's pretty complicated. Uh, I'm also an advocate of not putting up a no wake zone in this area as well. So I apologize for not reading all of your documentation, but also want to make sure that my voice gets heard and that um, we're able to keep that waterway open to boating in the future. Um, that's all I got to say, so I'll open up the time for the next person. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Um, next, we have Raj Savaro. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Ex excellent. So I'm a, a resident who lives on the river with uh, a variety of boats. So I have uh, a fair amount of experience with the area. I am actually south of your South Reach area per se, but nevertheless, I go through it all the time. Um, two questions. One is where is the alleged uh, service station going to happen for boating, uh, fuel, and pump out? And then the other question I have is um, is there going to be the same type of public input to the Oregon Marine Board as been seen here? Uh, I I agree with everyone. I think that the do not want no wake zones throughout the uh, entire area. It would uh, make things a madhouse, um, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I will ask staff maybe to answer those questions at the end of this, if that's all right. Um, but as I mentioned before, we will be sharing all this testimony with the Oregon Marine Board. So regardless of their process, they will have input from, from you as participating in this session. Um, let's go next to um, John Clinton. Yeah, hi there. Uh, as uh, others have mentioned, thanks for uh, hearing me today. I'd just like to echo uh, not in support of the no wake zone. My entire family, extended family, we're all big river users, both boating and non powered sup uh, paddle boarding, etc. Um, with that, I, I would like to see, I, I like the South Reach. Um, plan it, it it i think it would be beneficial to see maybe some river user um like non-motored only uh access points because i know the boat ramps tend to get clogged up with kayakers paddle boarders etc that are busy taking their things in and out and they need access too but oftentimes a kayaker can take three times as long to get in and out of the river as it takes a power boat. Um, so I'd, I'd love to see more access points for them so that they can, they can have their own place where they feel safe and can take their time to get in and out. Uh, but other than that, yeah, just echoing what Matt said earlier as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. Um, next I have Jennifer uh, Michael Ravy, Martina Highwolf, and then Robin Cody. So let's go to Jennifer next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer McElravey. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys for allowing me to testify. Um, I took uh, took some time to read the river plan. It's significant. I want to, you guys have put a lot of work into creating that document. I am basically following uh, an alignment with what, what uh, Mr. Clinton said. Uh, my family owns a powerboat. 
Um, it sounds like in the, the plan, the goal is to create a plan for everyone. And I think that if you're going, if your objective is to do that, I don't think it's realistic to have a no wake zone in that area. So my goal is to encourage you to partner with all the stakeholders in the planning process, support, uh, support the enforcement of current rules. I like what you said in the plan about creating non-motorized boat launches. I like what John said about um, having safe places for them. Um, also, I want to advocate for um, uh, what you said in the I, is for a good idea for having Multnomah County Sheriff support the current rules. I think that's really important um, to, to, to um, enforce the current rules in that area. So, okay, thank you so much. Next, we have um, Martina Highwell. Hi, my name is Martina Highwolf. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, it looks like I and 800 people misunderstood your document. So, um, and I made it clear in, in my heading uh, to, uh, to talk that I was gonna talk about that wake or no wake zone. So I, I wanna advocate for the Rappian areas. Uh, I live down here on the south waterfront. Uh, I can see the eagle nest. I can see the blue heron rookery from my balcony. Uh, I have seen a beaver sliced up from propellers on the beaches. Uh, I feel there's a big disconnect here. I feel like there's a lot of language going on. Uh, as my last name implies, I'm Native American. And I thought we were going to have a visual here, so I just thought I might as well uh, introduce myself as such. Um, I do feel like uh, when we're talking about everyone on the river, we're talking about white people. Because let's just get real here. You know, recreation on this section of river or on the river itself from Savi Island to down by Lake Oswego, it's pretty much a white, a white experience. And uh, so let's start uh, thinking about that as well. You know, I like the very beginning of this meeting where you were talking a lot about inclusion. Why don't we start thinking about inclusion on the river too? And let's slow these boats down a little bit for the wildlife and to protect these rapian areas. Okay, thank you, know, you I really feel like that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. And I will say that this, that people are welcome to speak about whatever they like to speak about. It's a tradition that we try to narrow the focus and, but we listen to whatever people have to say. So thanks for joining in. I will now go to Robin Cody. And after that, there'll be John Hall and Lori Silverman. So let's have Robin. Is Robin there? I will circle that name and go to- Yeah, John. Robin is here. I'm having trouble unmuting. Oh, one second, let's see. Okay, great. Huh. All right, I'm gonna try this out. Okay. Um, yeah, for some reason, Robin's mic is not allowing them to talk. Okay, should we? Jump forward and you can just give me a little ping. Can we ready to go back? Yeah, I'll, I'll keep playing with it. Okay, thanks. And Robin, thanks for your patience. Um, John Hall. Hey, good evening. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify before you all. And uh, I'll echo comments. Uh, appreciate the, the work that you've done so far. Um, you know, access for the uh, non-motorized uh, SUPs and kayaking. I think that would be a great idea to provide safe access and inclusion uh, for the entire river. Um, I live in the river in a floating home community in the South Reach and um, been boating for 35 years. Uh, have a kayak, a couple of, uh, of uh, paddle boards, and just would like to say that um, a no wake zone I view as unnecessary. Um, I think the uh, if the current rules were enforced and uh, education were were more um, focused, it would be a, a safe place for all to enjoy. So thanks again. Thanks. Take John? care. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
I go to Lori Silverman. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, thanks. My name is Lori Silverman. I've lived directly across Ross Island for a year. All of my windows face the Willamette, at least for the past three months. I have watched the river all day, every day, observing the traffic patterns of motorized and non-motorized boaters. Boats that generate artificial waves for wake-dependent water sports most definitely catch my attention as I watch the enormous waves splash on either side of the river. As I begin, as, as a beginning stand-up paddleboarder, artificial waves scare me. Motorized craft artificial surf waves are hard to cross. I carefully calculate what time of day to go out on the river and avoid the wake boats at all costs. I choose my SUP path very carefully according to the wave from the boats. When I get off my SUP at the south waterfront, I have to try to cal carefully calculate when to get off my board so that the large wakes don't crash me into the rocks. Two days ago, I mismanaged and I fell for face first flat into the boat ramp. I laughed, but it wasn't pretty. I also assist my husband, an amputee and longtime kayaker, into and out of his kayak on the same boat launch. Kayaking for him is the great equalizer when it comes to outdoor exercise. Managing the timing of those waves when launching him or offboarding him means the difference between his safe and pleasurable journey or the potential of a broken hip or worse. Please consider a no-wake zone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roy? Um, I'm now going to, is Robin Cody able to jump in? Okay, <clears throat> hearing that unresolved. The next three people will be Travis Williams, David Yasnoff, and Dustin Miller. So Travis Williams. Hey there, commissioners. I appreciate your time tonight. Um, my name is Travis Williams, and I'm Riverkeeper and Executive Director of Willamette Riverkeeper. I'm here to talk to you about building heights. No, all kidding aside. Um, first of all, I wanna uh, extend uh, my thanks and our thanks and many people who are on this call tonight for sending the letter to the Oregon State Marine Board that did recommend a no-wake zone to kind of get this discussion going. I think the reality here is we're not talking about all power boats being the issue. We're talking about boats that are specifically designed to generate three to four foot waves upon which somebody can surf. Basically, you're importing coastal waves to the Willamette River. And that, as a consequence, has impacts on other river users, whether you're in a PAL craft or a motorized boat. Uh, well, Lambert Riverkeeper, we use both. And for anyone else on the river, when you're trying to cross those waves, they have an impact. The uh, letter from Noah Fisheries that you've all seen, hopefully recently, uh, highlighted the, the notion that there is take occurring on this stretch of river. So my take home point is that the city of Portland and the, the Bureau of Planning uh, sustainability has a key role in helping to influence what the Oregon State Marine Board does moving forward. We're literally talking about several dozen craft that create the problem for everyone else. Again, I appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. Hey, also, think, just a minute. I think I might be in now. Yeah, oh, we have Robin. Robin Cody is now available. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, I will mention that when I put my hand up, you still have 15 seconds to go. So. Um, <laughs> You have, you have time to wrap up. Um, thank you. So let's go to Robin Cody um, next, and after that to David Yasnoff. So Robin, welcome Okay, back. well, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the misunderstanding people. I thought I was brought into the conversation here with the idea that it was going to be um, a slow, no-wake thing between Selwood Bridge and the Hawthorne, both sides of the river. And I... Um, I'm an author. I, I write about the river. I write uh, Clackamas River, one book, another book on the Willamette, another on the Columbia. And everything I write is about Portland as a unique major city with regard to wildlife right in the middle of town. And I'd like that what I write about, you can help to be true. We do a lot better than other places, but it can be even better, and especially with regard to the sound on the river. I'd like to have a river section, limited section of the river, just a little piece of the river, uh, where I can hear 
bird song where I don't have to smell exhaust. I'm with Judy, your very first talker. Uh, climate change is coming and electric boats are possible now. We got to help make change here. And on this limited area of the river, it's got to be slow, no wake, both sides, and let the boaters, the power boaters, go elsewhere. It's a really big river. And thank that's you. all I have to say. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you, thank you especially for your group. I was listening to uh, the rich conversation among yourselves, uh, and it was really nice. Well, thank Thanks. you to all of everyone who's stepped up here to testify. Um, we love hearing from the public. This is a great chance for it, despite COVID. Um, let's go now to David Yasnov. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks. Great, thanks for the opportunity to testify. Substantial note wake zones already exist in this area. For those that don't like wakes, there's already plenty of area to explore where wakes are prohibited. Public safety officials don't support this plan. Fire Chief Sarah Boone does not support this plan. Harbor pilot Steve Whalen does not support this plan. Further, who would enforce this measure? At a time when the economics of policing are in sharp focus, the proponents of this expansion of the wake exclusion zone are advocating that police be paid to guard their stand-up paddleboarding trips. If wakes are so bad for the environment, the goal would be to eliminate them everywhere, not just downtown. This isn't about the environment. It's about who will have access to our shared public waterway downtown not the environment. Further, eliminating wakes in any area encourages live aboard dilapidated boats to anchor as the primary residence for people who then dump raw sewage into the river where our families swim. Expanding the no wake zone would make all of downtown a live aboard homeless camp. Further, the dragon boat and rowing community also have a loud voice in opposition to wakes. I don't doubt they've had bad experience with discourteous boaters, but just as the solution to one bad driver isn't to slow I-5 to four miles an hour, the solution here is to name and shame disrespectful boat drivers and target them, not the whole community. Finally, boating and jet ski rentals should be not allowed unless the people hold a boating license. Much of the problems that the people in opposition to boating are describing emanate from people with no training or appropriate licensing for boating. One last thing, boats equal jobs. As another active water sports, the gentleman said, 160,000 boats in Oregon, plenty of jobs, plenty of money, plenty of taxpayers, and we stringently oppose this expansion of the existing no wake area. Thank you, David. Thank you. The next three people are gonna be Dustin Miller, Mindy Pesisek, and Casper Muir, and I hope you'll correct my pronunciation. Um, Dustin. We don't have a Dustin on the list today. I mean, who is here? Fair enough. Um, Mindy? Yeah, Mindy works. Um, I really appreciate all of your time. I know it's been a long meeting. I joined in at the beginning, and I really appreciate hearing your insight and what you're doing is important. I know that um, you guys have been working on this plan since 2018, and it's going to affect um, a large majority of our population as we all um, love boating and we all really enjoy um, Portland and I just wanted to remind this committee uh, with your decisions to think about um, all stakeholders um, as Judy had mentioned at the beginning talking about climate change and our future and what it would look like for future generations and access for all people um, like Martina was explaining for Native Americans and indigenous communities and um, people of color who may not have access right now and the ability to use um, the river to um, think about how that impact will be with your um, decision. And also to think about how Portland has the largest slow zone of any city, um, 1.6 square miles um, in the Northwest. We've done that on land. So why aren't we doing this on the river? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mindy. And now we'll go to Casper Muir. Thank you, Eli. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, much appreciate being here and like your plan very much. 
preserving the environment, wildlife, fish protections, and all of those things are built into that. And, and I think it's terrific. And I apologize that we have hijacked your agenda with vague issues. Uh, the problem is they have been growing on our minds for the last two years due to humongous proportions. Uh, it started about two years ago when our wasabi blind paddler's boat was capsized by a wake from a wake boat. And there were 18 people in the water Half of them were uh, blind people. Three of them were trapped underneath the boat. And I was the president of the club. And so I, have, I took an immediate interest in that right away. And I've been at it ever since. Uh, at the beginning, we had the Sheriff River Patrol and the Coast Guard and the, uh, the fire department, uh, Station 21 involved. But they pretty much all went away. Sheriff's Department hasn't seen us for a long time. The Coast Guard has changed its mission, and so we feel kind of abandoned. And so that's my story. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The next three people will be Lindsay McQuaid, Holly Sedgwick, and Daniel Wolf. Um, Lindsay, you're next. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks. Fantastic. Hi, I'm Lindsay McQuaid. Uh, I am the president of the board of directors of the Rose City Rowing Club. I grew up in Portland rowing on the river, uh, spending all of my high school afternoons on the Willamette. And um, that experience truly shaped me into the uh, person that I am today, learning confidence, teamwork, uh, determination, among other positive things. And so my role with the Rose City Rowing Club is to really um, promote and protect those uh, athletes that participate in our sport. And um, when I hear stories of uh, unsafe incidents where uh, athletes are injured by weight, um, that's a big concern for me. So, you know, my request is that we um, are creative in finding our solution. Um, I think the river is something that everyone should have access to. And um, to me, it's very important that children, adults, everyone uh, are safe as they access that river. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and I look forward to hearing uh, the future steps. Thank you, Lindsay. Holly, you're next. I don't think we have a Holly here today. Okay. Um, Daniel, well? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Um, I spend a lot of time on the river in various human-powered watercraft. I've been capsized once uh, by a large wake from a high-powered boat, and I'm often concerned about being capsized. <clears throat> I'm also on the faculty um, uh, of environmental law at Lewis and Clark Law School, so I appreciate the jurisdictional challenges that you face in having one agency regulate boats and speed, and you have to... Um, provide for uh, user safety as well as natural resources protection. So I guess what I would emphasize is that <clears throat> the city needs to find creative and strong ways to partnership, to partner with the Oregon State Marine Board because the city's plan puts a great deal of resources into encouraging river recreational users as well as protecting natural resources along the river. And in my view, huge wakes, especially from large wake boats, put lives at risk, as well as substantially impair natural resources as the National Marine Fisheries Service emphasized. Um, the city's restrictions um, impose millions of dollars of costs on developers and riparian landowners. And those, in order to protect natural resources, and those costs are being, those investments are being compromised by large wakes as well as safety being put at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Daniel? The next three people will be Cindy Hickman, Daniel Hobson, and Shane Rice. We'll go to Cindy. I don't see a Cindy here, so next should be Daniel. Daniel Hobson, thanks. Is this for me? Yeah, Daniel, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I can hear you. It's a little bit muted, but I think we can still hear you. So you're. I'm trying. Uh, I'm not sure of my technology here or which microphone is operational. So it's working. 
Excellent. Um, I'm a river user. I am a person who inhabits the cove out here at Ross Island, and I can shed some light on Justin's decision. We respect Ross Island. We respect Ross Island's property. We are quiet. We are the devil they know. We don't try and do bad things out here, and we get a hold of people when they're new to our community and get them on the right track. We're generally just old guys with white beards. So it helps for us to be here. And uh, perhaps I could have left, but felt I was more meaningful and useful here. I keep boats that are operational. I watch every boat with an eye towards the design of the boat and the survey of the boat to estimate safety and the safety of the boater. We get things in line with boater safety real fast, as fast as we can. We've had a few people show up who turned out to be real problems over the years. A lot of them have just simply worked out quickly in a couple of months. Some lasted too long. Selwood suffered real hard from uh, a real disaster case, but we're working on being better citizens out here at every turn. We have severe outgrouping behavior at our docks. We are trying to work against a published attitude from people. Uh, unfortunately, it's coming down through the news that most people are very responsive to us uh, in a bad way. So. Um, if we can try and get more in line with what people want. I haven't even touched the topic that I set here. Fiberglass is recyclable. Nobody knows this. We don't have a problem with boats on the river. We have a bottleneck in the recycling industry. It will resolve quickly. And I'm gonna ask you to, um, we're over time. Good, I've said my say, and I'm sorry to basically be so disjointed. Thank you. No, thank you so much for chiming in. And you can ask, I said earlier that people wish they were on the river. It sounds like you are on the river. Um, okay. Next, we have Shane Bryce, Kyle Crafton, and Lawrence Gleason. So I'll go to Shane. This is, this is Cindy Hickman. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear. Yes, yeah, Cindy, um, please jump in. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, my name is Cindy Hickman, and I'm the coach coordinator for Wasabi Paddling Club. Um, I'm also a steers person with nearly 20 years of experience, both locally and internationally. And I can tell you that steering alongside a tow wave type boat is both dangerous for my crew and terrifying for all of us. I've been swamped several times with what appeared to be intense on the part of the boat driver. And not once have I seen a boat double back to check on the chaos they caused. Now, I'm not asking that these boat owners stop using their boats. I respect their property. I love boating at all speeds. And I'm asking that they be assigned to a different part of a very long river where danger to non-motorized boats, rowing crews, outrigger canoes, sups, personal floating homes, and, sen uh, and sensitive wildlife and shorelines are not present. It's past the point of attempting to share our wonderful river with motorized and towing boaters who continue to show a lack of regard for lives and property. Please consider the no wait zone. I thank you for your consideration, and I invite you commissioners to contact Wasabi Paddling Club and experience a ride on a dragon boat on a warm summer night when power boats and wakes are present. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Cindy. Um, now we'll have Shane Rice. So Eli, I don't see a Shane Rice or okay. a Crofton. Okay, Kay, so Cal Crofton is next. And after that, I have Lawrence Gleason, Bonnie okay. Lewis. I think Lawrence Gleason should be next here. Okay. Do we have Cal Crofton? Crofton? No. Okay. Sorry. Um, Lawrence Gleason. Hi there. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. You're great. Yeah, great. Um, so I'll, I'll waste the first bit of my 90 seconds saying thank you so much. You guys are awesome. And Debbie did a brilliant job of summarizing a huge amount of comments. So thank you. 
Um, I'm both a uh, lover of riding in motorboats and both of my sons participate in the Rose City Rowing Program. Uh, we've heard a lot and it's clear that a significant chunk of this should probably be aimed to the, to the uh, State Marine Board, but I, I echo a previous uh, testimonial that as you guys are considering what the future of this stretch of the river is, um, and as we are encouraging additional recreation usage, just keep in mind we're already a victim of our own success in that there's a lot of people uh, on the river, and I can account for two specific instances where I've seen boaters, motorists, uh, intentionally cut through um, uh, human-powered craft and speed off. And so I, I, there was somebody who said naming and shaming is important. I think that's, that's challenging uh, when the people who would jot down registration numbers for the boats are busy trying to pull bodies uh, out of the water. Um, so I just ask uh, as a part of the, the consideration set here that um, I'm in favor of creative solutions and let's consider safety as we look at the diversity and the community using the river. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. I now have next Bonnie Losek. Oh, I don't see, and nor do I see a Ryan Hatton. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying the best. I'm going off a printed sheet here, and the names on the right are jumping around a lot. So I have Willie Le Levinson next. Um, yes. Willie, you're on. Greetings, uh, committee. I just want to first say that uh, Black Lives Do Matter. We want to acknowledge with Human Access Project that there has been systematic racism around swimming and access to the outdoors, and that we want all people in Portland to feel safe at the river's edge, in the river, and not to feel intimidated. The mission of Human Access Project is uh, transforming Portland's relationship with the Willamette River. We are for all river uses where people connect with the Willamette River. Uh, I did serve on the Oregon State Marine Board Rulemaking, com rulemaking Committee. My conclusion, um, based on these conversations, is that these uses cannot be shared. To me, it's very similar to a cross-country ski trail where you can have snowshoers and you can have uh, cross-country skiers, but snowmobiles do not belong there. I mean, that's a case where there's small snowmobile parks specifically for those motorized uses. Uh, the cost of boating overall um, is not accessible compared to swimming and non-motorized boating. And again, um, when there's dangerous conditions on the river, it's not safe and it is intimidating for a broad use of users. So I do understand and empathize from the motorized boaters um, that people feel like something's being taken from them. This is the 10th year of advocacy for Human Access Project. I've met many people who've told me stories about how they water skied on the Willamette way before it was safe to do so. That is how much they love the river, that they were prepared to put themselves in health's way in order to recreate. Uh, but in our mind, uh, the solution that we'd like to see pursued is a water sports priority zone that starts at the steel bridge and goes north. This is a way to add capacity to the river. Um, there are- uh, Wrap up, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Oh, wrap up, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we went over there and I had my hand up. So I'm gonna have to uh, move it down to the next person, but thanks for your testimony. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Neil. Corbett? Hi, thank you. Him, um, Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. As a 30 year resident of Portland and a member of the Stationel Rowing Club, I've seen a lot of citizens' resources invested in improving the Willamette River. Your mandate is to protect, conserve, enhance, and maintain the many qualities of the river, including recreation. I urge you to consider the undisturbed qualities of the South Reach, as well as the increasing safety needs of a growing recreational population. You opened your meeting tonight talking about how to address diversity needs and affect transformative change. Making this no wake decision tonight is a simple step in ensuring access for all citizens. As development and infill of the South Reach continues, more people will use this space, increasing the potential of a very serious human powerboat conflict. Currently, fast moving powerboats and wake enhancing watercraft damage floating homes threaten the safety of rowers, swimmers, paddlers, kayakers, stand-up paddle boarders, and cause thousands of dollars of property damage yearly. The establishment of the snow wake zone would allow for a variety of users to fully maximize their use of the river. Without it, it's like inviting people to use a playground that has a freeway running down the very center of it. 
If you do not choose to take action tonight, I would ask what is your proposal to protect the property and safety of everyone who loves the Willamette? Please protect our investments, including your past work by establishing a no-wait zone. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, Mia. Appreciate the work you do. Thank you. Um, Thomas Orth. Hi, I'm also with Station L Rowing Club. I've heard the power borders claim an enforced no wake zone prioritizes rowing and paddling over them. What they are failing to realize when they argue this is that when power boats are on the river, they immediately take priority over everyone else due to the danger and nuisance inherent in their size, speed, and wake. The river simply becomes a different place when they are there. As soon as they arrive, all attention turns to them, and whatever we're doing or thinking must stop as we prepare for and deal with their presence. I asked the power boaters here, when was the last time you had to cancel your boating plans because rowers or swimmers were making you unsafe? For, the, for us, this is all too common, and I get it. I've been in power boats. It's impossible to understand from your perspective how terrifying and dangerous you are. Priority indeed. I also noticed Schrodinger's power boater. Schrodinger's power boater is so wealthy and generous and, and generates so much revenue for their expensive hobby that they argue in effect that their rights supersede ours. But on the other hand, they are simultaneously the victims of a shadowy elite seeming to deny these poor everyday folks their constitutional right to blast up and down the river in the middle of the city with abandon. Tom McCall imagined something better for Portland when he removed the freeway from the riverfront and created a beautiful space that we have all enjoyed. Let's take the next step. This river was infamous for Superfund sites, but could be like Forest Park, a nearby place that is accessible and, and free and, or low cost for healthy outdoor recreation, not just the few who make it dangerous and intimidating for all but the most hardcore athletes. Thank you, Thomas. Next we have, I'll tell the next three people are Paige Stoyer, James Hilsenteger, and H. Palmer Kellum. Um, Paige, you're next. Hi, thank you very much for having us all on here to participate in this, this process, which I think is really important. Um, first, I'll just say that I don't think there is a misunderstanding in terms of why people are commenting on the wake um, request. As Travis pointed out, it's because of the letter that you all sent asking for that large no wake thing. So it, it is relevant why that's what everybody's talking about. Um, so the, the biggest issue we have is that the, the BPS um, South Reach planning process and the plan that came out of it um, really left out many key stakeholders um, and the affected user groups, businesses. Um, and in fact, that's what led to um, you know, the, the mayor's office saying that really needed to, to hold off on the final vote and reopen public comments. Um, but even over this last month, when we've repeatedly asked to actually have BPS talk to and, and meet with all of those, those stakeholders that it, it's acknowledged were left out, they have not done that. So, you know, we're back here today with a final vote on it, but BPS has still not talked with any of those businesses, user groups, community groups, all the people who had been left out of the process. So, um, basically, you know, the plan as it stands and, and was commented on in some of your meetings that, you know, that it was meant to prioritize paddlers will really reduce public access and diversity on our river. Um, one of the other disturbing aspects, I think, um, other than that it hasn't been inclusive, inclusive um, is that it's going to create a number of safety issues and increase user conflict. We're, we're trying to find ways to, to lower it, but as the I'm going to ask that up. You good? Yeah, I was just gonna say the city's own safety officers have said it's actually going to create more safety issues. So, okay. Thank you very much, Paige. Um, next we have James um, Hilson Taylor. Who I don't see here, Eli. I do wanna, I do wanna let you know that it looks like um, Holly Sedgwick is here now. So um, no James, but maybe you go to H oh, and then Holly. Holly, okay. Holly, are you able to chime in? Perhaps a technology issue? Hey, without You're Holly. Now, Holly. Oh, are you there? It looks like unmuted, but why don't you check the next person and then we'll try again. H. Palmer Kellum. Can you hear me now? I can hear, yes, and please introduce your name so we know who's sharing your story. 
Hi, my name is H. Palmer Kellum Jr. I'm a native Oregonian. I've lived on the banks of the Lama River for over 50 years. I'm a member of the Oregon State Marine Board Rural Advisory Committee for the Lower Lama River. I'm a fisherman, a rower, a paddler, a swimmer, former long-term water skier, and my wife and I like to cruise around the river with our family and friends. I wrote this message to Mayor Ted Wheeler today, and I'm going to share it with you and your committee. During the PSC meeting on March 10th, 2020, Chairperson Eli Spebeck was recorded in a conversation with the senior panel, Debbie Bishop, okay, and said, the Southreach plan is going to prioritize paddlers over motorboats, and we're going to have to find, quote unquote, tricky ways to get the Oregon State Marine Board to go along with our plans. Hmm. With his admission of deceit in dealing with the Marine Board, Chairman Spevic has rendered any and all processes directed towards the South Beach plan as, and I will use a term often found in legal investigations, fruit of the poisonous tree. He poisoned the tree, that be your committee, with his deceit, rendering the fruit of that tree poisonous and unusable. Please scrap the existing South Reach plan for the Lambert River usage and start over with representations from all interested river user groups and a management plan that will prevent growing more poison fruit. I believe that Lambert River is a wonderful resource and all of us need to share it. Our mutual calling going forward. Ask you to wrap up, please. To lose the selfish and start with the sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now go to Renee Morgan. Yes, hi everybody. Um, thank you for tonight, I appreciate this. I'm speaking, though you can't tell this is one voice, but it's actually 4,000 people. I represent Calm Water Coalition. Um, this is the group of um, paddlers, boaters, marinas, schools, mortgages, environmental organizations, businesses, and homeowners in Southreach. There's a lot of us. We've been working together for about two years um, to find some kind of solution to everything uh, from, you know, uh, from boats being tipped over, capsized, swamped, um, property damage. Um, and I would like to first thank the commission um, for its work, it, the work it's doing, and echo uh, Lawrence Gleason in thanking Debbie Bischoff and all of you for all this work. Um, also, I want to point out that the plan's contents just almost everything in it came from input and ideas shared with the public over about a year and a half. Um, so there's no real secret that uh, the slow no wake zone works and aligns with very many of the objectives and goals of boating and in river recreation. Um, and I thank you for that. Um, we applaud your, uh, the Bureau and the commissioners uh, coming together to recommend some safety regulations for Southreach. And we hope that because this is the most highly congested area of the Willamette, you will continue to support us um, and influence the OSMB in helping us to resolve this problem. We agree with so many that there needs to be specific areas for both wake boarders and non-motorized boaters. They just simply aren't compatible together. Um, so other cities are doing this. Seattle has a no wake speed and regulation. I'll ask you to wrap up, Renee. Okay, um, there are at least four here in the area on this, in uh, the Pacific Northwest, um, who are already doing this. Thanks so much, we re really appreciate it. Thank you for testifying. The next three people I have are, and I'm, I'm not able to look at my screen at the same time as my list, Aaron Smith, Robert Salinger, and Jordan Bice. And if there's someone not here, we'll just move beyond. So, okay, so I, I don't see Aaron here, but it looks like Holly, you might be able to speak now. Do you wanna give it a shot? We can see that you're trying to talk, but we can't hear you. <laughs> We're hoping that three times is the charm. Yeah. All right. Which I'm not getting. So let's go on to Renee. Uh, Aaron. So Renee, so I think it's. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, Bob Salinger. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, good evening. My name is Bob Salinger. I'm the conservation director for the Portland Audubon Society. Uh, I want to express, express, express my appreciation for all the work that you've put into this plan and for this hearing tonight. Um, and also for your letter to the Marine Board. I'm here to testify tonight uh, in support of a no-wake zone. Uh, Audubon's been working for decades to protect and restore this portion of the river. We also uh, lead a lot of trips there, and uh, it's always been hazardous, but it's only gotten more hazardous over the years. And that's a combination of speed and also uh, the technology that has evolved to create these huge artificial waves, the kind of waves that you would never find on a river like the Willamette, uh, that are dangerous to people and also undermine all the work that's being done to restore the river. Uh, so we strongly encourage you to keep working with the Marine Board to find solutions uh, to implement no wake zones where possible. Uh, we'd urge you to prioritize places like the Holgate Channel. We really have this incredible natural area complex with Ross Island, the Holgate Channel and Oaks Bottom uh, that really deserves to be a safe, protected area for people to enjoy nature. Uh, I'll just end by saying that um, I've heard some comments tonight about the process, and we've been involved in a lot of city processes. I think this one's been very good. It's been a real effort at outreach. Uh, we've attended a lot of different meetings over the uh, last couple of years. I think there's been a lot of opportunity for participation. So again, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Bob. Now I'm Jordan Bice, and after Jordan, we'll have Emily O'Brien, Micah Mescal, and Norberto Gliosi. So um, Jordan. Here to back, members of the commission. My name is Jordan Weiss, and I represent the National Man Marine Manufacturers Association and the Water Sports Industry Association. There are over 168,000 boats registered in Oregon, and we appreciate the opportunity for the voices of some of these boaters to be heard today. While the recommendation was not explicitly included in the plan to expand no-wake zones, we would like to go on record with our opposition, opposition to expansion of no-wake zones on the Willamette. We're very concerned that any further plans to restrict wake boating on the Willamette will create serious safety issues. The Oregon State Marine Board recently instituted rules for the upper Willamette that will severely restrict wake boating along that stretch of the river. If more boaters are squeezed out of the lower Willamette, boaters who had previously been spread out over several miles of the river will be condensed into a few highly congested areas. This not only exacerbates safety issues, but it would make enforcement of these rules much more difficult as frustrated boaters will have to choose between breaking the no wake rules and risking harm to their loved ones on the water. If the project truly intends to pr protect erosion and damage from the marine ecosystems, this also fails uh, to accomplish that goal. With more boats sharing fewer spaces along the water, those portions of the river may be at higher risk of experiencing environmental impacts. Portland cannot protect one part of the river at the expense of another. We can and should have thoughtful conversations with our local decision makers and stakeholders about the best ways to ensure a bright future for the river. However, we also believe that it's imperative that we protect equal opportunities for Oregonians to safely share the water. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jordan. Emily O'Brien. I don't see an Emily in our list of testifiers here. I'm good, Micah. And I don't, and Micah was here, but left, it looks like. Okay. Um, well, I will circle these names and come back at the end. Um, Norberto, are you here? I'm not seeing on the list either. Oh, yes, I see Norberto. Um, um, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Hello. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Norberto Liozzi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of uh, for testifying today. I'm a resident in Portland since the last six years and a member of Station L Rowing Club in the last four. Um, can, you can you hear me? I okay. can hear you. Yes. And, uh, and uh, I would like to express uh, my support for a no wake song. It seems obvious to me that uh, the activities of power boats and the rest, human power boats and swimmers, are totally inc incompatible. Um, it's very clear that uh, kayaks and dragon boats and rowing and uh, rowing boats and swimmers, we can live together in some kind of an harmony. But every time that uh, there is a power boat, it, it disturbs the activity of everybody else. And uh, many times we have to postpone or cancel our activities, rowing activities, because of the amount of power boats interfering with everybody else. Yeah. 
So this is all I yeah, have to share thank you, now. Roberto. You're welcome. Thank you. Next, I have um, Peggy Hennessy. Hi, thank you for taking testimony tonight. We would like to see the wake and wave action reduced in the South Reach area and would like to see the South Reach zone extended to the Waverly Golf Course so that it incorporates that area south of the Selwood Bridge and can better protect the floating homes and the marinas, the Keyside Marina, and work that way. Um, while I understand you don't have the jurisdiction directly to regulate a no-wake zone or slow-wake zone, um, under objective 10 of the South, South Reach plan, you've got a provision that allows you to develop and expand partnerships that promote and address voter education and safety, reduce conflicts between different watercraft, and minimize the impacts of the watercraft on shallow water um, habitat, riverbank erosion, and floating structures. And so I would like to encourage you to partner with the state and local jurisdictions and make recommendations to them for a slow or no wake zone to protect the resources and the wildlife habitat and the conflict, the inherent conflict between the motorized boats and the human driven boats. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Next, we have Jenny Haas. Yes, I'm uh, Jenny Hazi. I am the coach for the Telecom Drag and Drag Boat team um, and a member of the Dragon Sports USA here in Portland, which has hundreds of members. Uh, I support the no weight zone. Um, I think that through the downtown area, it's, it's imperative to have a peaceful environment for everyone to uh, recreate. Power boats tend to uh, take up the volume of the uh, river during the warm summer months. And um, we have experienced in many cases not uh, being able to be out on the water and uh, practice as we normally would, but we are in a defensive mode just to protect ourselves from being uh, swamped or capsized. Um, if we could find a way to uh, share the river and have an area for non-motorized with motorized, I'd be all for that as well. Um, I'd welcome you to pass this on to the Marine Board. And this is, this is what we'd like to see happen for uh, the river in Portland. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Jenny. Next, we have um, Nancy Butler. Or I'm not seeing her signed up right now, so that would go to Graham Taylor. Eli, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Eli. Uh, my name is Graham Taylor. I'm born and raised here in Portland, lifelong resident. Uh, I learned to row on the Willamette Oh, 25 years ago, um, became a world-class rower and eventually moved back to Portland and, you know, uh, love it here and love the river, love participating in all of his activities, including using my wakeboard boat on the Willamette River and on lakes. And um, it's interesting how these sports have become incompatible. Rowing has been around on American rivers for 150 years. Water skiing was popularized in the 50s and 60s, wakeboarding in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. But it wasn't until 2010 or so that these high energy wakeboard boats uh, were patented and developed and really started creating all this conflict that we see now. Uh, I want to urge you to, I don't think that we, as a wakeboarder, I don't see the need for a, a full on no wakes zone up and down the Willamette. I see the need for um, safety, the elimination of these high energy wakes that are three to seven feet tall uh, from these boats that are capable of destroying the embankments and, uh, you know, really limiting the diversity of people that can use the river, taking it away from paddleboarders, rowers. Um, they cause a dramatic um, 
safety concern. And I just, you know, really urge you to encourage diversity, encourage you to consider protecting our natural resources and partner with the Oregon State Marine Board to ensure the safety of all users and eliminate these high energy wake boats. Thank you. All right, thank you, Graham. I have next Steve Dunnage, and after that, that's the end of the printed list. I see some more people on the uh, participant list, and it's hard for me to tell who might be speaking as well. So I'll go to Steve, and then. Um, so Eli, um, I don't see Steve here, and that's all we signed up to testify. Okay. Um, the reminder that testifiers had to register by 5 p.m. last night, so this this should be complete then. Okay. Is there anyone who I missed? I, I missed Jeff Todd, Robin Cody, Dustin Miller, Holly Sedgwick. Any of them around? Want to give it one more try? Okay, um, with that, I will close the, uh, thank you everybody for your testimony. Um, we appreciate the time you take to sign up to this, engage in our process and, and share your wisdom. I'm gonna close public testimony now on this project and shift gears to where we get to deliberate. And I think I'd like to start by asking PSC members um, to raise your hand if you'd like to, oh actually, I had a couple, I had one note actually. Should we ask staff, there are a couple specific questions from testifiers about the pump station, public input to um, Oregon State Marine Board. And I think that those are the notes I had. Does staff want to answer those really quickly before we jump to discussion? Happy to do that. Um, in the River Plan South Reach Action Plan, um, there has there is not a location identified at this time for a, a, a gas pumping and a pump up gas fueling station and a pump out um, station. Um, part of the process would be to work with the community members and this would be the parks and recreation as a lead um, to identify a, a appropriate location uh, for such a facility. So there is no identified facility at this time, but it's an identified need that um, folks would like to see addressed. Okay. And in terms of the Marine Board, um, they're accepting comments until um, June 29th. And then the Marine Board is, uh, according to their staff, will be meeting July 22nd and 23rd um, to continue their discussion on rulemaking in the Lower Willamette. All right, thank you, Debbie. So as a reminder, and perhaps speaking to some people who testified, um, the PSC does not have purview to set the rules for recreation use of the um, Leonard River, um, nor does city council. So we will be sending this project um, hopefully today to city council. And we can, if we'd like, include additional letters, um, comments in our um, accompanying letter that goes to city council, but even city council is not the recommending body on this. So for people um, who've spoken now, your comments will be forwarded to the Oregon State Marine Board. Um, and they have their own process that they'll go through, which will involve the city of Portland, I'm sure, as they do their rulemaking process. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it up to PSE commissioners to share any thoughts they have on, um, on this topic of river recreation. And so I'll open the floor. I see one from Mike to start, so let's start there. Well, I actually have an amendment that, I, that I'd like to introduce, but I can wait until other folks um, have their input, and then I, I'm happy to, to read my amendment. Okay, well, knowing that's coming, let's go to Chris Smith, and um, we'll see if you have a couple other comments before we go to your amendment proposal. Chris. Sure, let me turn my camera on. Um, so I wanna make sure that we apply the lessons we learned in the earlier part of this meeting. Um, it occurs to me, we've seen no analysis of the demographics of the, the human powered boating community versus the power boat community. And I would hope that uh, somewhere before the Marine Board makes their decision, they look at that and if there's a uh, particular BIPOC representation, you know, disproportionately in one group or the other, that that be a factor in, in this. Um, you know, my, my assessment of the testimony is there's clearly uh, asymmetric impacts of one group on the other, uh, and that clearly needs to be, that conflict needs to be managed in some way. Um, I honestly don't think I have an opinion on whether that's a complete no-wake zone or some kind of regulation on uh, boats that, you know, produce artificial wakes. Um, you know, the, the tool is unclear to me, but uh, the need to manage the conflict is clear. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Any other comments from the commission for discussion? Oh, Mike, I think it goes to you. Oh, I see Oriana's hand. Oh, that's right. Sorry, Oriana is a co-host, so she cannot raise her um, digital hand. Oriana. 
Um, I'll make this quick so so we can give it over to Mike. But I think I just want to echo Chris's Chris's comment about considering racial justice in this context and just name the number of commenters who uh, obviously listened to our earlier conversation and are good lobbyists and bringing it back around. Uh, but that that I think to me was very impactful to to consider the the impacts of one group on another and the potential racial justice implications that may come up here. In particular, I thought that uh, Martina Hightower, uh, gave some really compelling testimony and just want to give a shout out to her. I'll also just name that because we are not only a steward of the comprehensive plan, but a steward of the climate action plan, that that's something I think we should be considering in this conversation as well, is what is the impact of motorized um, watercraft on, on not just the river, but on air quality or the greater uh, impacts associated with uh, the fuel transfer uh, and the system that uh, supplies the fossil fuels that are, are used in boats. So I think that's something that we should consider in this conversation as well, is not just the planning issues, but the climate issues that uh, we like to talk about in this space sometime. And I'll turn it uh, back over to you, Eli, to turn over to Mike. Thank you. Um, Mike. Yeah, um, I, I tried to um, really narrow the focus of my amendment as much as possible to address all of the issues that were raised. And I'm I'm not surprised to hear that 68% of the folks who presented written testimony and, and a majority of folks who gave oral testimony provided um, many good reasons for us to interact with the Marine Board recommending establishment of, of an expansion of the float and awake zone. Um, and so my amendment goes to on page 359 um, in River Recreation Objective 11 to add one ongoing um, action, which is the city of Portland needs to address river recreation safety and ecological health of the river, will petition the Oregon State Marine Board to establish a slow, no wake zone between the Hawthorne and Selwood bridges and at Powers Marine Park in Oak Rock Island. And we've heard a lot of testimony, read a lot of testimony that in my opinion would justify expanding beyond that, uh, at least to Waverly. And perhaps I know some people have argued all the way to Elk Rock Island. But I think um, Hawthorne Bridge, the Selwood Bridge, really focuses on, in on the area of the greatest conflict. There's no question about that. And I'll just say I've been leading kayak trips um, for almost 40 years in that area, and it's only gotten worse over the, particularly more recently with the uh, uh, with the wave-inducing um, designs on boats. And I, I just wanted to, to also suggest there are a number of other issues that I think we could address in our transmittal letter to city council. And so, for example, um, in addition to, to the new action item establishing an expanded slow no wake zone, we, the commission, urges the city to continue to monitor shallow water habitat and cold water refugia in partnership with USGS and DEQ to evaluate if expansion or additional site-specific slow no-wake zones are needed to protect endangered salmon species in their habitats, including the potential for a pass-through zone south to the city limits at Elk Rock Island. We urge the city to work with the State Marine Board, as has been suggested, to increase signage on the upstream and downstream ends of the no-wake zone so the public is more aware where the zones are. And it will be important for the city to work with the State Marine Board and Multnomah County Sheriff to create and distribute voter education to reduce conflicts among river recreationists and ensure compliance with the regulations. I'm not going to read through all of the, the eight rationales that I outlined to, uh, to my colleagues on the commission. I will say, however, that to address Oriana's point and others, the expansion of a slow no wake zone addresses equitable access to the river in that an increased sense of safety will encourage more people, including people of limited means, to recreate in non-polluting, low carbon modes, including kayaking, canoeing, stand-up paddling, and to Willie's comment, swimming in the Willamette River. There are, we, there are many other rationales that I think we, we all picked up on in uh, the written testimony and the oral testimony to justify expanding the no wake zone. And by the way, the, the no wake zone currently does not cover the entire Holgate channel. This will include the Holgate channel, of course. 
So that is my proposed amendment. Thank you, Michael. So to peel off the specific amendment out of that, although much of this would go into a, a letter if we approve it, um, is that the city of Portland would address a new item R11D, that the city of Portland would address river recreational safety and ecological health of the river, will petition the Oregon State Marine Board to establish a slogan and wake zone between the Hawthorne and Selwood bridges and at Powers Marine Park in Elk Rock Island. Correct. Second for that. I'll second it. I heard that from Katie Larsell. Thank you, yes. Katie. Um, so it's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion of this amendment? I will chime in that I'm supportive of this amendment and I, I saw some commentary in the written testimony about the importance of signage. So although it's not in the amendment here, I think that that's a, um, so people know when they're entering or exiting a no wake zone. Um, and for those who are um, boaters um, with engines, they know where they can travel um, and, and they're outside the zone. Um, any other thoughts? All right, then we are, um, oh, I have um, one from Ben. Please jump in, Ben. Just a question, um, perhaps for Mike, but it might be more of a technical question for the Marine Board for them to decide. Um, but th there were a couple of comments that kind of struck my interest that uh, refer to these new uh, high energy uh, wave uh, um, generator, three to four or more foot high waves. Is that what we're really talking about? Uh, obviously, you know, boats that go beyond the speed limit and, and, and don't uh, respect the rules are also the problem. But I'm, I'm just wondering if this, these wakeboard uh, um, uh, devices on boats that are causing the problem, or really if uh, if it's if it's a broader issue. No, uh, it's a much broader issue. They 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 are it, it is a huge problem, and they need need to be addressed. But I'll just give you one example. When we worked with the Marine Board to establish a slogan wake zone on Holgate Channel. Um, and this is not, there, there are many instances like this, but uh, a couple folks testified who were in a, uh, an outrigger canoe. And it was, it was not one of these um, craft that accentuates the waves. It was simply a, a motorboat towing a water skier. And they weren't paying attention. And they literally sliced through their boat, through the um, outrigger canoe. So that, that's, that's not a function of, of these new design boats. It's a function of people acting inappropriately around Ross Island. Um, so it's a huge safety issue in addition to the environmental impacts that these larger wakes are, are creating um, with the new design boats. So you're essentially saying that speed is really more of the factor or one of the Correct. It's a combination actually of speed. It used to be that the slow no wake zone was related to a five mile an hour speed. Well, once the new boats came online that could go slower than that and still create three to six foot waves, uh, the Marine Board changed the rule to address only wake, period. But speed is certainly also a, a big part of it. In fact, I wish we were talking about establishing a speed limit on the Willamette, frankly, um, particularly in downtown. And I, and I have heard there's an exception for um, police or fire boats. Is that correct? That is correct. So I'm going to um, ask you if you guys will indulge us to extend our meeting time to like 7.15 or 7.20. If someone's going to need to leave, please let me know. But I'm hoping that we can complete this. I, I, I'm glad that we took the time to have this um, additional testimony and topic. Um, but I'd also like to have a chance to move this to city council. And Oriana, I'm going to jump in. Yeah, I don't know if this is exactly a friendly amendment, um, if it may be accepted having not seen the language, but I think at least for a letter, I would like to recommend or request that in addition to kind of talking about the ecological impacts, uh, um, that we also uh, have some consultation with Laura John or with at &I or just some consultation with tribes, acknowledging that especially on the salmon issue, um, the the restoration and maintenance of salmon populations is uh, a resource issue for, for tribal governments and for indigenous communities. And I just want to make sure that that's a lens. I'm very much in support of uh, what Mike is putting forward today, but I want to make sure that that lens is brought in. And then just put a slight asterisk, which going back to the conversation around houselessness, 
uh, make sure that we're being conscious of the folks who are living on on boats and that whatever is being kind of enacted here, which seems more on the recreation side, uh, doesn't have some unintended consequences or displaces folks who are utilizing boats uh, as homes in, in this arena. So just want to name those two issues. Um, Eli or Mike, uh, you could take it how you will in terms of how that may be incorporated or whether that feedback is received. Well, I, I consider that a very friendly amendment, and I, I would like to see it in the in the transmittal letter. Um, to that to sounds appropriate to me. Um, particularly, any more comments on the amendment, amendment in front of us? Then, Julie, can you please call a vote on that? Okay, uh, back rack. Uh, yes, I have a clarification. Are we vote? We're not voting on. This is just on the amendment. Just, right. ideas. just the amendment, and we've, we've shared some ideas for the transmittal letter. Yeah, aye. Okay, Port Alonso. Yes. Uh, Hauk? Yes. Marcel? Yes. Magnera? Yes. Rouse? Yes. Miss? Yes. Be back. Yes. And that motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming to speak speak with us this evening. Um, let's move next to the enforcement um, topic, and I'll hand this back to staff. Hello, everyone. So uh, Jeff Cotto with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. I'll share my screen to um, so we can discuss the next topic. Um, so we're revisiting. Um, excuse me here. Just one sec. So we are revisiting just a few remaining items from uh, related to watershed health and resilience. Um, there are two things that we wanted to discuss this evening. Well, actually, there were two items to raise this, this evening. One of them we did not identify for additional discussion, but if others would like to talk about it, we can discuss. But so the first is a continuation of a discussion that we initially had on May 12th related to enforcement or code compliance improvements uh, for tree, tree and vegetation removals. Um, this proposal has also, um, you know, includes what we are proposing, includes mitigation and then also um, during river review. Um, the second that we have not identified for discussion is just a minor code update um, to the standards for removal or pruning of vegetation. You can see the language there on the bottom of the slide. In discussing the proposals that were associated with dead, dying, and dangerous trees with uh, actually with, Mr. with Commissioner Hauk, uh, the error in this portion of code, we identified that there was an error that probably needed that we should uh, be uh, rectifying. So it should read except for dead, dying, or dangerous trees. And, and um, you know, vegetation removal or pruning is, uh, is prohibited between April 15th and July 31st. And that's in the, specifically in the riparian buffer area. Um, the reason is that um, you, know, it can't, you, you can't be all of these. So it should be if you're dead or dying uh, and, dang and dangerous. And then, mm -hmm. so this will avoid confusion by the Bureau of Development Services. Um, and then also we will update the commentary just to make sure that it's clear that the dead, dying and dangerous, um, uh, the dead or dying uh, can only be removed in cases where those trees actually impose a, an immediate danger which is already identified in, a, in the previous section of that, of that chapter. Um, uh, in the, or, uh, but we wanted to make sure that it's clear in the, in the commentary. So um, unless someone has any issues related to, would like to talk further about this, this minor update to the language and um, uh, related to uh, dead, dying, and dangerous, we can move on to just speaking about um, kind of enforcement. Any questions on that item? Dying or dangerous? All right, let's proceed to the other item. Okay, so um, really what we're looking at here is trying to ensure, uh, to improve code compliance. And we've had, we had some discussion, as I said, in May 12th, and we have been, uh, since that time, we've been working with uh, BDS staff to develop specific code updates to best implement an expanded monitoring program to ensure that uh, the required mitigation and remediation um, is maintained over the long term. 
uh, as described in the memo, the replacement memo A10 part two that we provided to you, staff recommends extending the terms for providing confirmation of compliance from one year to three years in the standards for removal or pruning of vegetation um, and only when uh, a minimum and when at least five trees are required. So if you have to plant fewer than five trees, you would only have to show compliance in the one year, the one year compliance, which is the existing. Um, additionally, three years of compliance will not be required if only nuisance spe tree species, or again, dead, dying, and dangerous tree or dangerous trees are to be removed. Um, in these cases, uh, for the dead, dying, and dangerous or nuisance, it would similarly be just a one year compliance requirement. Uh, second, we are recommending uh, requiring a three years of documented compliance as a part of the mitigation standard. Um, so when a project is able to use the mitigation standard um, and also uh, for option two, these two are very similar in the way that they're structured uh, in terms of language. So that's why they're, they're put together here. Option two for correcting violations to the river environmental overlay zone. So with both of those, we are proposing um, when the mitigation or planting area required by either the mitigation standard or the option or option two respectively is at least a thousand square feet, then you would be required to um, show compliance for annually for three years. Um, mitigation or planting areas less than a thousand square feet would again only be required to show compliance for the one year. Um, these two recommendations will reduce the fees required to be paid when, a pro when project impacts are limited. Uh, we really wanted, and also, or, or when an applicant is simply looking to remove a nuisance tree or uh, remove a tree that, that poses an, a danger. Um, we really, for some of those smaller projects and um, for people who are trying to do, do the right thing and remove, um, say for example, nuisance trees, we wanted to make sure that they wouldn't have to pay um, an additional fee to do those things. And then finally, in river review, um, we recommend that we up, update the, uh, to update the requirements uh, to directly state the expectation that uh, the operation long-term maintenance plan must ensure the maintenance and protection of resources and functional values, and to add a requirement for annual monitoring uh, reports for up to five years. Um, the length of monitoring will be at the discretion of BDS based on the size and scope of the, of the mitigation or remediation uh, required. Um, this would only apply to mitigation uh, required through river review as well as corrections to violations that go through river review. So we have what is called option three in the code where um, if you don't meet, if you can't meet the criteria that are in option one or two, you go through a full river review to resolve um, as a, to, to resolve the, the, uh, the violation. As a part of these enforcement discussions, the, the potential for potential role for performance guarantees came up. Uh, performance guarantees require an applicant to pay a fee based on the cost of required work that is then returned once the, the work is complete. Existing language in the River Review chapter allows Bureau Development Services to uh, use performance guarantees. So in cases where it's warranted, uh, BDS will require a performance guarantee uh, to ensure compliance. But if that again is also up, up to them to determine where it's appropriate. Uh, we thought for efficiency that we it would be best for us to just vote on these water health and resi resilience uh, items and a minor uh, macadam design code amendment, which you'll learn about uh, next together. So I'm not, I don't have a, a a motion for these things specifically, but if you if we have any questions about um, these proposals, uh, I'm happy to answer. Answer them. Any questions for Jeff? Let's move to the next piece. Okay, so Debbie is up now. And I also express an appreciation to everyone for staying a little bit late, and for my partner who brought me dinner. Um, and thanks to everybody on the commission who has. Um, to everyone who's supporting all their fellow commissioners, because it's a lot of time to volunteer for this. Um, so um, thanks to all the support folks out there. No. And staff so, too, of course. Hello, everyone. Um, so we realized that we need to make uh, a few more minor uh, code changes 
uh, related to the um, repeal of the McAdam uh, corridor special design guidelines and um, go, moving forward with the DOZA citywide design um, guideline recommendation and the McAdam character statement. What we realized we needed to do, excuse me one second. Brian, please. Um, my partner's using the ice machine right now. It's driving me crazy, sorry. Um, and um, so what we need to do is there's a, um, in chapter 420, which is design review, there's a series of McAdam design district maps or series of design district maps. We need to remove um, repeal the map that re, uh, relates to the McAdam uh, design district since it's going to go away and be part of citywide design guidelines and citywide design and the design standards. And then there's references in two different code sections um, that need to be updated with the renumbered um, design district maps. So that's what this is about. It's a very minor edit and um, that's the recommendation there. Any questions? It's pretty minor. Okay, next slide. So um, here is a motion, uh, your straw poll motion um, that deals with the code compliance improvements and the, and the McAdam design code amendments. Um, all three are there um, for your consideration. Thank you. Sorry, I muted myself. Was it someone like to make this motion? It, yeah, Eli, this should be an actual vote. So you need a, um, okay. I'll move approval. Mike's hand up. Would you like to discuss or propose? Well, uh, Chris already moved, so I'm in a second. Okay. I, I, I would have I would have moved, and, and mainly because I wanted to thank staff for really a lot of arduous work. Um, I had a number of concerns, and staff was very responsive. So I'm happy to second uh, Chris's motion. Thank you, Chris and Mike. Um, is there any discussion on this batch? Okay, then Julie, please call a vote. Okay, back rack. Yes. Porter Lotso. Yes. Hauk. Yes. Larcel. Yes. Anera. Yes. Rouse. Yes. Smith. Yes. Spivak. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Now I think we go to our um, wrap up vote, if I'm correct. Yes, that's correct. Well, congratulations to staff, us and public for getting to this point. Um, we've had a series of straw votes along the way and this motion will roll those together into the um, full package and um, something we can vote on <clears throat> the city council. Would someone like to make, and do we need to add to this, bring in the amendment that we discussed earlier related to um, R11D? Yeah, so you should just, you should just add um, that right? amendment to the list today. Okay. Okay, well, I'm hoping that someone would like to make this motion. I would be delighted to make this motion Step so uh, moving to amend River Plan South Reach to be consistent with the memo titled "Just Whatever What Is on the Current Slide" plus the uh, the amendment uh, previously um, previously entered and voted on. Thank you, Seth. Is there a I'm second? Happy to second that as well. Thank you, Mike. Um, any discussion? Oriana. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to offer a friendly amendment to this motion, which is just to direct staff to consult with the Office of Tribal Relations in this process. I don't think we have anything specific that will really trigger that, but I feel like, again, just coming back to that, that issue that this is a resources issue for tribes and indigenous communities, that that is, is part of this motion, is just doing a check-in and making sure that everything is written in a way that is supportive of, of relationships with um, tribal governments. That is a very friendly amendment. Um, is Julie, that what staff can implement? Just checking. We, we've been working with Laura John all along, but we'll, we will certainly check in with her again on all of these items. Yes. Okay. Um, so we have a 
Motion on the floor, any discussion down that friendly amendment? All right, Julie, you can take a vote, please. Hey, back rack. Sorry to be the one that's always confused. Are we voting on the friendly amendment or? We're voting, voting on everything. On everything. Just yes. the full package now. Okay, yes. Okay, order lots of. Aye. Hauk. Yes. Larcel. Yeah. Enthusiastically, yes. Agnera. Yes. Rouse. Yes. Smith. Yes. Feedback. Enthusiastic yes here too. Thank you so much for everyone to work on this project. Yeah, thanks to staff, really. Yeah, you guys, um, we're expert at this and that, yeah, thank you staff, especially for listening to us all the way along the way and to the public because we can tell you we're listening because that's how sometimes these items came up for discussion and there wasn't a lot of discussion because you'd already listened and, and baked it into your recommendations. Um, so the next steps in this process will be, um, maybe I'll let staff describe that for me so I don't mess it up. Yes. Eli, um, sorry to interrupt. Before we go, I just wanted to add my appreciations to the staff and um, also uh, recognize that this is Debbie Bischoff's last um, presentation to the Planning and Sustainability Commission because um, after many years at BPS, she will be retiring at the end of this month. So really wanted to take a moment to express our appreciation to her and her um, hard work and uh, helping to lead this process and I uh, wanted the PSC to have an opportunity to express that as well. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate, um, entire staff deserves a, a huge amount of praise, but Debbie in particular really, really had to do a huge amount of back and forth and a lot of work and, and her participation on the Marine Board Advisory Committee, I think was really important. Uh, to keep us informed as well as to keep the city in the loop. So congratulations, Debbie, on your retirement. I wondered if that might be coming up. <laughs> Is that what the ice cubes are for? <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope it goes out on a, on a, on a positive note. Um, I, I said, gather you'll be around for city council? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all. So, um, uh, Eli, the, the next step is to talk about the transmittal letter to council. Okay. We've shared some things already for that. People have additional ideas that they'd like to have included in that letter. I'm seeing Mike's hand going up. I see Steph also. We can do real hands. Yeah, I, 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 I think I'll provide something that it kind of expands, something that really couldn't be dealt with in the code that expands on um, enforcement because there are some issues with regard to uh, staffing and, and budgets and so forth um, within BDS that I think needs to be addressed in a, in a transmittal letter that really doesn't lend itself to code language. Okay. Um, Steph, do you have something? Yeah, I was just... Uh, um... I hadn't gotten a chance to, to mention it last time, so forgive me. Um, again, related to um, tribal engagement and uh, collaboration uh, when recognizing culturally significant natural resources, so that the city has an aspirational goal to utilize um, uh, at least 20% of COVID certified um, contractor firms, primarily for uh, construction, but I, I, would, I would love us to, to um, uh, to highlight the the importance of um, exceeding that, particularly when we are looking um, when we are talking about culturally significant natural resources and any contracting related to that. Thank you. Thanks. I'd like to say that I hope the letter includes a comment of just how much Portlanders love this river, um, and I think that that should be a headliner because I think that came through in this project from many voices. Um, and um, even though there are sometimes um, river conflicts we, we've discovered, um, it's because people all love it um, and want to spend time in it, on it, under it, around it. And um, so I hope that comes through. Is that enough for staff to work with? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so Jeff, can you show the next slide?
So these are the next steps. Um, we have a design commission hearing on July 16th, where we'll be talking about the repeal of the McAdam design guidelines and the um, McAdam character statement. And then we actually have a city council date of August 27th at 2 p.m. currently. Um, and uh, we talked about the transmittal letter there. Um, I don't know if you have any other um, guidance for the transmittal letter to design commission on the McAdam character statement. Uh, staff has drafted something that, um, that they could share with you if you'd prefer that. Unless um, Mike's hands up, yes. Yeah, I do. Um, well, I participated in the neighborhood meetings and I know there was a, a huge amount of angst over this particular issue in terms of, from, from, the, from the perspective of the neighborhood in terms of the character statement. And I just wanted to again say staff, I think did a good job of listening to the neighborhood. And I, and I had heard very favorable feedback from folks in the neighborhood who have been working on the Willamette River for many years. Those staff should be thanked uh, for actually listening and responding um, uh, to neighborhood input. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, Cassie Ballou and Laura Lillard. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie and Lillard. Um, okay, then with that, I will. Um, Give a little look ahead that our next meeting will be covering the design overlay zone amendment project, the anti displacement action plan, and an introduction to the e zone map correction project. So, we've got a few things coming up, and I see Jeff's hand, so I'll call on that um, before we adjourn. What's up, Jeff? Thank you. I, I, I know everyone wants to go, I'll be brief. Uh, I know I had got an email somewhere along the way, maybe from Julie, saying we'd be talking about the upcoming schedule beyond just the quick. Uh, over you, you gave Eli, and I've looked at what's online, but I'm, a couple of things I'm wondering about. We, we never got a briefing on the E-Zone. And that's, I, that's coming at your that's next meeting. I just, I just wanna highlight that, that the tentative agenda right now is extremely tentative. We're still okay. working on even for the next, for your July 14th meeting. So I don't wanna make any promises till we have a, we have a conversation with some mayor's office staff and we have a conversation with BPS leadership and other project staff in the next week. And so the notice for that meeting will clarify things. Okay. Um, the, other, the other point I, Jeff, I know that you- I think had a briefing on E-Zone. Let me just be finished. I'll be brief, Julie. We've never had a briefing on the E-Zone, I don't believe. And so I'm uncomfortable getting our first briefing two weeks before a public hearing. I mean, that just doesn't seem... But... So anyway, that's just a concern. Take it into consideration. And then I did not know we were working on a Title 33 changes having to do with houseless... This is a comment you made, Eli, earlier when Mark Jolin was testifying. Have we... Did I miss that? Did we have a briefing on what those proposed changes are? And so no, that, that's that's much farther in the year it's in the fall okay i'm gonna get in but trouble if I make these as, as we get to with, with with doing everything virtually and that it'd be helpful just to kind of know as soon as you can i realize you, you're still figuring out when what's in the pipeline when might we see it just kind of it, it always uh I hate to learn about something so late in the process when I go, oh, really? We've been working on that for a year and I've never heard of it. So just just keep us in the, in the loops. And maybe this is something I haven't gone to officers meetings. Maybe our officers know about it, but remember us, uh, the little people out here don't always know what's going on. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm looking at a link which we can resend, which is a tentative projection as Julie appropriately reminded us. It's showing that project coming to us in October. Um, so uh, Mike. Well, raise your hand just up. Okay, with that, I will adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the sun.